Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Wasi Tesfa, and I'm a member of APAC. It is with honor and privilege that we welcome you to our annual meeting. I am your, co your moderator for today's conference. What a difference a year makes. APAC's mission is advancing the interests of Ethiopian Americans and the Ethiopian people. When the TPLF waged war against Ethiopia, we stood alongside the ENDF and the government of Ethiopia to fight for the territorial integrity of the country against TPLF. It was never about government, but always about the people and country. But at this time, as we hold our conference today, we are facing a very different Ethiopia. We are facing a government that is both anti-people and country. Ethiopia can now boast as one of the few places in the world where her own government is working for the detriment of the country. Today, the government has not only turned its back on its people, but is virtually harassing, impoverishing, and attacking every part of the populace. A perpetual genocide is being committed on the Amhara people by the government of Ethiopia and the Oromia Regional Administration. The Afar people are still suffering the consequences of a two-year war with little or no help from the government. Guragis are barely burying their dead, whose crime was asking for water. In Gambella, the people are being attacked by South Sudanese forces. Children are abducted and no safety provided because the ENDF is acting as a police force instead of a border security. Ethiopia is now more than ever vulnerable for external threats. The numbers of people that are targeted because of ethnicity are multiplying consistently. It seems like an ethnic apartheid system is being pushed on the populace, and it is only a question of time until minority ethnic groups are engulfed and swallowed up in the whole country to this movement. The two Abrahamic religions that are the pillars of Ethiopian society, Ethiopian Orthodox Church and Islam are being persecuted while mosques and monasteries are being bombed and destroyed as imams, priests, and monks are killed. The last time a monastery was bombed in Ethiopia was under Mussolini in Debra Libanos. Our religious and cultural fathers and mothers are being attacked and atrocities committed against them. The faithful are also being persecuted. Meanwhile, Addis Ababa, our cosmopolitan multi-ethnic city is being choked by a new ethnic-based belt city. I dare say it must be one of the kind in the world. As homes are demolished in Addis Ababa, rendering over 500,000 people homeless. Private citizens are being attacked by gangs as well as government security forces. The TPLF that has led the country into a crisis is being rewarded while those that fought for the country are being persecuted. The results of the peace agreement forged in Pretoria and Nairobi seems to point towards rewarding TPLF, paving the groundwork for the annexing of the Amhara territories of Walkait, Tagade, Humara, Tellamt, and Raya by the belligerent TPLF. While the patriots that fought alongside the ENDF, such as Fanno and Luyuhai, are thrown in jail or dismantled, lawlessness prevails in the country. The internally displaced are now at a high 6 million compared to none in the world. The leaders of the country are building palaces to compete with their Middle Eastern heroes while the populace suffers abject poverty, lacks food, shelter, water, and education. Food aid, which was meant for the people suffering from food insecurity is sold to other countries while Borana starves to fund the luxury ambitions of the leaders and to buy weapons to further oppress the people. And in Tigray, while guns are silenced, there's no food. This is the backdrop we will be discussing for the legislative action strategy for Apex for the coming years. So with this, I will introduce our next speaker, who is Nasrin Taganu, who is a 
uh, chairperson of APAC, our fearless leader. He's a nationally recognized thought leader in pharmacy benefit management, PBM, and who, who over a 25 year career built a pharmacy benefit management company administering a multi-billion dollar transaction nationwide. An early pioneer of PBM, Misfin has built one of the country's leading PBM organizations, transforming it from near startup to an industry leader, which currently hires over 470 employees. Following his vision of taking a pharmacy benefits management industry to a higher level in the 21st century, Misfin established RX Paradigm, Inc., a new entrant into the market to facilitate paradigm shift in the PBM marketplace which aims to influence the industry by employing a never before available level of transparency into drug pricing and reimbursement. We love to hear that. Musfin spearheaded the establishment of the American Ethiopian Public Affairs Committee. And like I said before, he's our chair and fearless leader, Musfin. <laughs> Thank you, Wasi. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we are, I'm going to have a slide to guide our uh, discussion today. So what, what I'm going to do, my role today is going to be to walk you through uh, what happened in the last uh, 22 months, the, the work that was done, the accomplishments, and then the priorities we are setting for 2023 and as we get ready to launch uh, our uh, efforts to support Ethiopia and, and, and then uh, while uh, improving the U.S. Ethiopia relationship. With that, uh, let's just get grounded on why we set up APAC in the first place. The mission of the organization was, was, was uh, to advocate for a pro-Ethiopia agenda at all levels of the U.S. government. So that mission includes advancing democracy, rule of law, respect for human rights, free press, entrepreneurship and economic development in Ethiopia. Also uh, to strengthen and foster the U.S. Ethiopia relationship, advancing both countries security interest with a pro-Ethiopia policy. So uh, this is where we were last year and, and this is where we are today. We are in APAC in the same spot as the pro-Ethiopia organization from the inception and, until now. Now, <clears throat> So then we said, how do we get there? How do we do this? So if you, for those of you who have been with us for the last 22 months, I know most of the people here in, in the audience, as well as many who are not, uh, you know, you, we, we have discussed this in the past. The goal was to get 10% of the United States Congress elected with the populated with pro-Ethiopia candidates. And in order to accomplish what we said we'll accomplish, we said that is a precondition. So that was the goal. That is 47 to 50 House members and 10 senators. And then the second goal that was set to get to that goal was in the Manacho uh, uh, organizations that are uh, uh, in the park, Sragrach, Ankara Ihono organization Akwakomo, Le Generation Mitalal Bamadrag, Strong Ihono Path, Magpak, Mikoko and Beth Mangalai, Focus Maragana, Yan organization Set Bamarak, the full time staff Buhono employees, and then Ilo Chagoj, Miss Anakara organization for Marag. No, Gulu Henomiti. Minada Regendo and then highlights Lamanagagarial accomplishments in the Lachon. Bamidim Maradreja, you know, we are thank you to all who participated in all the activities and the initiatives across the country, all Ethiopian Americans, all the different organizations, all of you APAC supporters. Thank you for all of you because of that. APAC has become a leading and authoritative voice on Ethiopian American issues in Washington, D.C. Uh, this is done in a very short time. Usually it takes companies, organizations along many years to do that. Some of the highlights uh, in the Matka uh, in the last 22 months, uh, our, our uh, 
uh, APAC has made APAC members, supporters, uh, different uh, chapter leaders, but but the guy like uh, within the United States structure of Seattle and Obamulu, we have met with over 120 elected officials in the US Congress. Uh, legislative uh, successes have achieved, uh, it either weakened or blocked uh, legislation that we believed were harmful, uh, 445-660-3119. Uh, we, we, we also have been able to block uh, the word genocide from the NDAA, National Defense Authorization Act, Bakalalu, uh, and then negotiate for mutual but strategy now. Uh, in your terminology for in regard to the conflict, legal asyl must must be tested. Legislative point of view. And the home uh, is very uh, uh, effective campaigning in, in uh, Virginia. Thank you for all the team that the Virginia team and across the country that participated in that in that uh, exercise. Uh, the Ethiopian American voice was. We claim is is a factor for the new the current Virginia governor's win, and uh, and then and then and then Mary Moll, the example we can tell, was a champion of Archbishop Ochun, with the capital we want that it had to go Sra was significant. Ingridi ben bezi ben nezi gizayatus Africa report mono Africa intelligence mi balut has recognized EPAC as one of the uh, pre prominent African uh, 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 advocacy groups or EPAC PACs uh, mil uh, belal. Kazam kazam malfungidi um, EPAC has also ad ad advocated for humanitarian aid, uh, although. Because of our reach, we were able to advocate for humanitarian aid both in in. Uh, Conflict impacted areas, especially on Hamar and Afar regions. Uh, APAC has published a significant number of reports. Uh, an, an article produced uh, both factual and visual stories on a correction on T TPLF and Western misinformation campaign on World Guide, Ghana and Raya. Uh, worked with academics and, and John Ab Abing and uh, Anne Fitzgerald to get solid work published. Uh, yeah, and then in, in more, more importantly, we have also uh, helped campaigns, uh, the 2022, uh, 2022 midterm campaigns by, by using targeted Facebook ads in addition to all other stuff we did. Effectively, uh, the digital media would have let me to a mistake. So, let me just this one. Now, this number is important because most of the elections that were won uh, were won by very low margin. Now, the year, the year, and but now participate by the regular match of what I and as this targeted campaign, effective in a borrow. And then, and as you, uh, yeah, uh. APAC has initiated uh, a little later. We'll hear from the person who spearheaded the Ethiopian constitutional uh, amendment work. Uh, that, in, that that initiative has been also initiated as a result of the feeling that we had uh, Ethiopia of the corporate constitutional diaspora engagement in Bami Malakat. The Ethiopian Americans organized Buhana Mangad. ይመረባሩ <laughs> Uh, every week, uh, twice a week, every other week, some saba yada ragu via day to day thrown ya kaida lo malatno. Kapres engagement ba kul balafo amat kul kholas matu journalist balai core journalist gar gring gringness marak tashilwal 
directly responsible ولا سامانه ارتيكلوتش تصفوال indirectly responsible for a lot more articles بزو عينت major media لاي بزو فوتشم انترفيو اتشم ترغوال كتكلوتش اللي متكا سيال بلومبرغ واشنطن بوست سي ان ان اي بي اف بي فاينانشال تايمز ان رويتر هاد بين few of the media that we we are interacted with ngidi ba taglala ba ba taglai ye media coverage ye press coverage ከዛ ማልፎ በዲጂታሉ ላይ ብዙ ዲጂታል ፉትፕሪንት ቢልድ ተመዝግቧል አይን ጀስት ኢን 18 ማንስ ኦቨር 62 ሚሊዮን ኢምፕሬሽንስ ያለው ዲጂታል ሚዲያ ፎርም ለማድረግ ይችላል ሌሎች ሌሎችም ፎን ቱ አክሽን ቮተርስ ቾይስ ካምፔይን በመጠቀም ከመቶ ሺ በላይ ድብዳቤ ለኮንግሬሽናል ለኮንግሬሽናል ሪፕረዘንታቲቭ በተለያየ ኢሹ ላይ ሚደርስበት ስራት ሰርቷል ፎር ኢትዮጵያ there has been um, work done to support uh, uh, the idps in, in, in those impacted uh, through the, during the war uh, apac has supported uh, fundraising in afar and our group has been also active in in uh, more importantly in in the 2022 midterm election uh, we have you know all the work that i described earlier has has resulted in a major uh, uh, accomplishment of of, of the salasam switch nominate kadaregnacho salasolot switch have been elected to office kanazi ust ngidi buzochun ye ethiopian american caucus ust جو ايجا بالو نو ات ليست سوست ار تو اوريدي بلوت تو اوريدي ار ان ان تو تو دو ان تو اور ثري اوف زيم هاف هاف اجريد تو تو جوين دو كوكس اند هيلب ان وات نيدز تو بي دن اند وي اكسبكت بوزوتشو تو تو بي اوف ا جريت سبورت تو وات وي دو ان ان از وي از موف ان تو 2023 برايورتيز So when we talk about 2023 priorities in this zare uh, discuss le naragum yefelegnaw ahun accomplishment wochun na ya mindo bajiru it isaron sira ke summarize kadarukun bohala 2023 mindin no min naragaw no 2023 um because of the uh, situations a change in 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 the political landscape landscape in Ethiopia what should our priority be ይሄንን ይሄንን ለምን ለማለቅ አንድ አንድ ሰርቬም ተካይዷል ከኔ ቀጥላ በኤቲ ሰርቬው ሪዛልትን ታሰማናለች የኢትዮጵያ ኮከስ ሪቫይታላይዝ ሆኖ ሌጅስሌሽን ምን አይነት ሌጅስሌሽን ሳፖርት ማድረግ እንዳለብን በዚህ አመት how we do with that revitalization and how we proceed with that Chris Trump uh, our new legislative consultant will give will briefly talk about that a little later ና ከዚያ ከዛ እንግዲ በማያስ ሌላው ከ ኤፓክ ኤፓክ ቻፕተሮች በናንድ ዝም ኤፓክ ፓርቲሲፔቲንግ ሳፖርቲንግ ሜምበርስ በየስቴቱ ካለው ኖሊ ኤሌክትሮ ኦፊሻልስ ጋር ክሎዝሊ ከከብ ግንነት ማርግ ይቀጥላሉ ዊ ፕላይ ዊ ፍላይ ቱ ዊ ፕላን ቱ ሃ in in september before september timeline before they go into session uh local ethiopian american local official gar yallaw yallaw relationship himat nakero sura be local daraja ndi katel zendro ka 22 ka 23 priorities ust ndi gaba tedrwal kezam alfo pro ethiopia us africa policy milon ከስቴት ዲፓርትመንት እና ከኤግዚኪቲቭ ብራንች ጋር በመሆን እዛ ላይ ፓርትነርሺፕ ፖሊሲ ዲቨሎፕ የሚሆንበት መንገድ ላይ ፓርቲሲፔት ያማረክ ስራይ ሰራል ብለን ፕሮግራማችን አውጥተናል እና ይሄም እንግዲህ ከ ከኤግዚኪቲቭ ብራንች ጋር ካለን ሪሌሽ የማጣናከር ሪሌሽንሺፕ ጋር የሚያዝ ይሆናል ማለት ነው 
በመጀመሪያም በ2023 ፕራዮሪቲስ የፐብሊክ ሪሌሽን እና ዲያስፖራ ኢንጌጅመንት ብለን ያስብ ነው ያዝ ነው ውስጥ ያው ፐብሊክ ሪሌሽኑ አሁንም ቢሆን የፕሮኢትዮጵያ ሜሴጆች በሎካል ኢንተርናሽናል እና ኢንተርናሽናል ሚዲያዎች ላይ መድረስ የሚሹልበት ሁኔታ ላይ ይቀጥላል ቀላል ስር አይደለም የሚዲያ ቢዝነስ ኢዝ ቬሪ ዲፈረንት ፍሮም what we all thought it is so ya ya honi ta yikatlal na be digital community ustum buzu sira andem tagut be digital community ust mikayed no na ye epac digital community community beseta akar honi ta product bi hone sira masrat michil betena project pe hon agenda be marra mel michil bet bosa lay focus focus wi noral na be ka hulum belay gen ye ሀያ 24 ፕሬዚዳንሻል እና ኮንግሬሽናል ኤሌክሽን ላይ ያንን ያልነውን መጀመሪያ ላይ 10% ሴትና ረጋለን ያልነውን ጎል ሱን እናተናገበት ይሆናል አሁን አይ ቲንክ ዊ አር ሃፍ ዌይ ዴር ከሚስተርም ኤሌክሽን በኋላ ከዛ ሙሉ ለሙሉ ዛም እንደርስበት መንገድ ይሆናል እና ሱ ላይ ስራ ይሰራል እነዚህ ናቸው 2023 ፕራዮሪቲስ ብለን ያዝናቸው ingri uh, uh, thank you wasi uh, now I'll, i'll send send the thing back to you ay kafta ye metarashaw slide ye metarashaw slide ke ihenin sira sna ka hid ingri indemta nda hon ndayachut betam intense yone sira no sirao na ye tede ye ye qatar ye abranach inge yadarancho ka farmosh nacho nezi ye ለመጀመሪያው ስድስት ወር ሜርኩይ ሜክሩይ ሜርኩይ ከሚባል ካምፓኒ ጋር ነበር የላቢና ፒአር ስራውን ስናካና ወኔ ነበርው ከዛ ለሚቀጥለው 10 15 ወር ደሞ አክተም ከይባለ ሎቢ ፎርም ጋር ሲሚላር ካምፓኒስ ናቸው ከነሱ ጋር ነበር throughout our whole uh, time from the inception of the organization uh, the uh, bellard spare ሚባለው ሎ ፎርም እና ፋይናንስ ማኔጅመንት የኤሌክሽን ሎ ፎርም እና ፋይናንሻል ማኔጅመንት ሚሰሩስ ካምፓኒዎች እነሱ ሃቭ ቢን ፕሮቫይዲንግ ዲ ሊጋል ኢን ፋይናንሻል ማኔጅመንት የካምፔን ኮንትሪቢዩሽን ሆነ ለሜምበሮች የሚያደርጉት ኮንትሪቢዩሽን በስራ ላይ የሚለው በ ኢትዮጵያ አሜሪካን ኤሌክሽን ቦርድ በሚፈቅደው መሰረት ስለሆነ ያን ያን ያውን ፋይናንሻል ማኔጅመንቱን አፕሩቭ የሚያደርጉትና ከዛ ምሬ ካሉ ሚዙት ሚዙ ካምፓኒዎች ናቸው ቤላር ፋርም ነው በሚጠረሻም ክሪስታም ሊጋል ኮንሰልታንት ሌትሊ የ2023 ሌጅስሌሽኑን የኢትዮጵያን ፎከስን አክቲቬት አድርገን በተጠናከረና ስትራክቸር በሆነ መንገድ እንዴት ምን ምን ምናርበት መንገድ እንዲያሳይ እንዲ እንዲረዳን እሱ ኢንጌጅ ሆኗል እና እሱ እሱ ሰፖርት አለን ማለት ነው በዚህ ሁኔታ ነው ያለፈው 15 ወር ያለፈው እንግዲህ ወደ ንቀጥለው ፕሮግራም እንዳለን ታንክ ዩ ወሲ ታንክ ዩ መስፈን አንድ ታንክ ዩ ፎር ብሪንግ ባክ ዘ ስላይድ አይ ቲንክ ዳት ሄልፕድ አስ አይ ሄልፕድ एवरीबॉडी ሲ ዋት ዩ ዋር ታኪንግ አባውት So thank you. So now we're going to have uh, uh Betty is going to present to us the survey and after Betty immediately after Betty uh Jeff Pierce and then uh, Binia Mawash will will uh, uh lead the discussion. So so let me introduce Betty Takasta also known as Shiba. She is the owner of Push Start Media and Consulting LLC. She has a degree in government and politics as well as an MBA and PMP. from George Washington University. She has consulted with Fortune 500 companies as a business and management consultant, business solutions consultant, process implementation expert with almost 20 years of IT business ops implementation. She is a change management expert and sa- and she has savvy marketing skills as we see because we she volunteers and works with all of us together. She's also a producer of online shows and podcasts. and more recently she's very much involved in the advocacy work around Ethiopia she has worked with idps uh, supported fundraising efforts and so i give you betty now go ahead my dear 
All right. Thank you, Asi. Uh, thank you for that great introduction. I I thank you for that. Um, I want to make sure that I can share first before I can start. Let me start it. Um, thank you again for that introduction, Wasi. Um, I'm going to be presenting to all of you the um, Reset 2023 Priorities public survey results um, conducted by APAC. All right, to begin, um, let's start with the objectives. The objectives of the survey was to assess the public opinion on a number of proposed actions or initiatives identified by members of the APAC committee um, and by serving a wide range and sending it out to us a wide range of the American Ethiopian diaspora community members and non-members and to utilize the survey um, feedback results to inform APAC, its board members, and as more board members on the general public sentiment regarding the proposed initiatives. And we'll get into the initiatives um, later on. So the method um, conducted or applied to conduct a survey was an online survey was sent out to the APAC email list that was sourced from a various range of partners and shared widely online with a subject, a generic subject of we'd love your feedback. The timeline of the survey, it was sent out on May 21st and closed on May 28th, so it was open for about a week. The target audience um, obviously was Ethiopian Americans, and our survey report showed that 95.9% .9 of respondents were somewhere in the United States, with uh, less than 5% um, elsewhere. Overall, 30,717 successful emails um, were delivered um, with the survey um, um, implementation. 6,044 recipients actually opened the email, 474 clicked on the survey, and 343 finally responded to complete the survey. And so what does all of this mean? Um, we can assume out of the 6,044 um, respondents or uh, actual people who received the email, um, there's about a 7.8% um, response rate or engagement. And furthermore, that actual responses were about 5.7%, which is well in the range of what's acceptable and uh, within a good margin of error for um, surveys. All right. The first survey question was as follows. The American government economic and financial support, including the IMF and World Bank loans, currently under consideration should only be approved based on strict action by the government of Ethiopia to stop the gro gross human rights violations, escalating corruption, ethnic-based attacks, religious non-interference, and initiating a resettlement and rehabilitation of the over 4.2 million internally displaced peoples. For that question, 247 out of the 343, so roughly 72% agreed. 64 out of the 343, so roughly 18% disagreed. And 32 out of the 343, or roughly 9.3%, selected other. Here are some of the comments um, made after that first survey question. And I'll just read some at tandem. The financial assistance must not be approved to the current government by any means. If this fund is approved from the past experience, it will not be used for the intended purposes because there are no means of means to monitor its use. My fear is it will be used to commit further genocide, displacement, and abduction to innocent civilians. The IMF and World Bank are pure evil colonialists that no one should ever do business with. Agree, but it is complicated. You're standing against Ethiopia and Ethiopians. While I agree with the premise, I am not convinced that the government of Ethiopia is in any position to stop the majority of the problems. Withholding loans by the IMF and World Bank will only exasperate the problem on the people. Should not have no agreement to anything, I believe the government violated universal human rights principles, even though we shouldn't submit to colonialism. How do you ask for sanctions on Ethiopia and Ethiopians? Shame on you. I agree with the above statement, but the government should get financial support to initiate a resettlement and rehabilitation of the 4.2 million IDPs. And lastly, it should never be approved under Abiy's administration. He's the Ethiopian Idi Amin. All right. The next question was the business community 
should discourage international private companies or investors from investing in Ethiopia for 12 months until there is a marked improvement in human rights violations by the Ethiopian government. 68.2% or 234 out of the 343 respondents agreed. 86 out of the 343 or 25% disagreed and 6.7% or 23 out of the 343 respondents selected other. Some of the comments are as follows. When Abiy came to power, he tried to make improvements. However, currently things are going from bad to worse. Absolutely, maybe even longer until there is a measurable peace and security to all people in which government stops the gross human rights violations ethnic profiling, escalating corruption, ethnic-based violence, religious persecution, and further the removal of the prosperity party. It is hard to get involvement as it is, and taking time off is not a wide strategy. The last question in the survey is as follows. There is merit in supporting the initiative by different Ethiopian American organizations that advocates restricting diaspora remittance for 12 months. For this question, 62.7% or 215 agreed, 29.4% or 101 out of the 343 respondents disagreed, and 7.9% or 27 out of the 343 selected other. Here are some of the comments. Strongly disagree, this is madness. I support the initiative, however, considerations should be made for those Ethiopians who continue to send funds to assist dependent family members. There are family members who depend on this fund. This action will hurt the Ethiopian people. Advocating restriction of diaspora remittance should continue as long as the government fails to meet its responsibilities. All right, so some general analysis that was made overall, and I'll start with the first one, a median average of about 68% of the people overall um, who completed the survey across all three questions agreed that some action to penalize the government through some form of financial economic pressure, including the withholding of loans, financial support, remittances, international business should be applied. And we'll look at some stats on that. Again, 68% were in agreement that some actions should be taken where 24% disagreed and 8% were somewhere in the middle. Secondly, um, the most agreed upon or the highest agreed was that pressuring the government through restricting financial support from the US government, IMF, World Bank loans, et cetera, had the most agreed percentage at 72%. And while 63 or yeah, roughly 62 to 63% um, agreed, with the remittance um, proposal, 29% was the most disagreed um, proposal amongst all the respondents at 101 people disagreeing. All right, just another picture or graphic to show that again, overall, across all three questions, you have a over two thirds um, of the respondents are in agreement with, uh, with all of the with all of the actions that were proposed with somewhere around 25% disagreeing and roughly 8% overall just in the middle. That's what this image um, shows again. All right, lastly, a median average of about 8% of respondents neither agreed nor disagreed and selected other. And these were most of the people that put comments uh, just as a general note. Comments reflected equally as strong opinions for and against actions to pressure um, the government of Ethiopia. And also notable is comments showed a repetitive concern for how financial restrictions would impact either those in desperate need for aid and relief, as well as family members dependent on receiving assistance from relatives in the diaspora, reflecting a need or lack of understanding and how these things would actually be applied. And that is all I have. Thank you, Wasi, back to you. Thank you so much, Betty. You really set the stage for our next two presenters. And that is, uh, I mean, it's a very good, very well analyzed survey. And so our next speakers, Sam Awash is an assistant professor of sociology 
and Criminal Justice at State University of New York, Oni Onta, and Adjunct Professor of Human Rights at Birmingham, at, at Binghamton University. He's also a founding member of the International Consortium for Geographical Studies of the Sahel. His forthcoming book is on violence in the age of climate change and an article on sanctions and the unraveling of Western hegemony. Okay, so let's start with Binyam. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much for inviting me. And uh, it's a good opportunity to uh, discuss, I think this very important issue with respect to APAC and its activity. And of course, uh, today I'll be focusing um, my discussions on sanctions, boycotts, and divestment, uh, particularly thinking of them as tools for resistance against ethnic discrimination, and human rights violations in Ethiopia. Um, so prior to the start of my talk, I just want to maybe touch on a little bit of my bio. Um, the last time that I was invited to an APEC event, uh, APEC event was um, wonderful. I had spoken about uh, sanctions. And interestingly, um, I was um, accused of being a spy, a TPLF spy. And then by others, I was accused of being a member of the Prosperity Party and perhaps on the payroll of the Prosperity Party. And I think the reason why I wanted to raise this is simply to indicate that I have no affiliation whatsoever with any political party. Uh, I have never had any affiliation membership with any political party. I do not get paid, and neither by APAC, which you're more than welcome to do so, but I don't get paid by APAC. I do not get paid by any government entity, et cetera. So there's no conflict of interest. And I think what's important, because what we're talking about is uh, very uh, politicized and in this case, a very polarized environment, both inside of Ethiopia and the diaspora, is to focus on the message and leave the messenger alone. And I think we can have differences in terms of ideas and that's very important. Okay, so that being said, uh, Masun, if you can please go to the uh, next slide. Okay. Oh. Down here. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, sorry. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So um, I don't know exactly how much time I have, so I'll make this very as brief as possible. Uh, and so for the duration of the uh, presentation, I'll focus a bit about the background. Uh, so prior to this, APAC, various civic organizations in the diaspora were very much united and unanimous almost in terms of their approach to sanctions. So giving a little bit about that background on why that was the case, what it looked like. Uh, after that, I'll talk about sanctions and what they are, how problematic they are, and make the contention that today in the discussion that we're having with respect to a general reorientation with how to deal with issues of human rights violations in Ethiopia, that we should say no to sanctions. After that, I will look at the pathways, the tools that may be available in terms of defending human rights and specifically targeting the ethnocratic and autocratic nature of the Ethiopian state as has emerged in the past five years. And so sanctions, boycott and divestment would be uh, uh, dedicated towards thinking about and brainstorming, if you will, uh, this issue of what tools are available, and finally, uh, concluding remarks. So with respect to uh, the background, um, if you can go to the next slide, please. Masfin, next slide. So you can see here um, illustrations of the uh, uh, role that APAC itself played, uh, but organizations, for instance, that I'm a part of, uh, Hope for Ethiopia, H4E in the New York tri-state area, and other civic organizations that really focused on protecting the sovereignty of Ethiopian state and also protecting the Ethiopian population from the negative effects of sanctions. Right. So in our discussions today, I want you, I want us to understand that there's two different meanings of sanctions. There's sanctions that are unilateral, coercive uh, measures 
Uh, and that's the meaning of sanctions that really uh, we were targeting and we were we were actively working against uh, in the previous iteration for the past two years or so. Uh, and there's sanctions from below, two dis distinct type of sanctions, right? Sanctions from above, sanctions by state and state actors and mostly powerful states. And for the most part, uh, sanctions have been used really by uh, uh, powerful Western states, and, and and secondarily sanctions from below. Okay, so you can hear, you can see, for instance, in this um, executive summary uh, by Misfin, uh, this is from 2022, uh, directed at the U.S. Envoy Jeffrey Feltman, in which quote uh, pledge to reverse the delisting of Ethiopia from the African Growth and Opportunities Act of Goa, right? A decision that is costing jobs in Ethiopia and the U.S. Uh, and so that's indicating another element which is important to understand, which is that you have uh, bilateral relationships, United States to Ethiopia, multilateral relationships with Ethiopia and multilateral institutions. It is legal for a country like the United States to cut bilateral aid, bilateral loan, bilateral grants, bilateral capital. Right. And so even in the case of AGOA, which is a bilateral relationship between the United States and, let's say, Ethiopia, uh, the advocacy uh, work that was being done was, again, to protect Ethiopia even from that. That's very important to understand, because when we talk about sanctions as a possible tool, it's really in the context of bilateral relationships between the United States and Ethiopia. Uh, multilateral relationships between different international organizations in Ethiopia, and of course, the European Union and Ethiopia, et cetera. So that's something to keep in mind. But these are just simply small illustrations. It's very important to understand also during this time, uh, I just can't pass without mentioning that there is a significant amount also, not large, but nevertheless, an important element of the diaspora that supported sanctions, unilateral coercive measures, despite all the things that I'm going to tell you about. So again, when we enter this political minefield and we're looking at tools in order to achieve political objectives, in this case, human rights and the protection of human rights, the protection of Ethiopian rights, uh, the uh, stopping of violence and ethnic discrimination, et cetera, um, we have to understand that there might be differences as well. Um, next slide, please. So this is, uh, again, an illustration of the uh, very well-coordinated uh, movement, uh, both in the United States, uh, Europe, across the diaspora. Uh, in, the, in the context of the United States, it was an attempt to impose HR 6600, S3199. Again, these are illustrations of unilateral coercive measures. That's what ma'akab or sanction means. We're not talking about bilateral relationships, uh, multilateral relationship institutions, and the decision, legal decision, to cut those ties. We're talking about illegal measures to impose sanctions as a punishment on a country. And so that is what's reflected uh, in this. And that is the way in which uh, myself, in terms of my presentation, APAC, various civil organizations understood the action, that it was an attempt to violate Ethiopia's sovereignty, to violate the domestic politics in favor of one of the belligerents that was attacking the Ethiopian state, and so on, right? And a very important element here, if you see in the poster, it says, no more to proxy war. One of the elements of the evolution of unilateral sanctions, unilateral coercive measures, has been as one of the tools within a toolbox of warfare. Proxy warfare means warfare without having direct, your own direct uh, military force and soldiers on the ground participating. Rather, you can have mercenaries, you can have proxies on the ground, and you can also, again, use unilateral coercive measures as part of that warfare strategy. And so we were against war. We were against war against Ethiopia. And that's what this indicates. Um, so if you can go to the next slide, please. So just a very quick summary, uh, five points on the problematic nature of unilateral coercive measures. The first point 
Sanctions is a form of warfare. Sanctions kill. The second point, and very important, it's illegal. Unilateral coercive measures are illegal. There's only one way in which they can be legal. Third, unilateral coercive measures, sanctions, are more and more being used by powerful states to maintain their economic, political, and cultural dominance in the world. And particularly when it comes to the global south, of which Ethiopia is a member, it is actually against the development of Ethiopia, right? Against the development of developing countries. Uh, so sanctions is a tool of anti-development. The fourth element here, which is important, is that it targets and hurts the most vulnerable, right? So what is the impact of, of sanctions? If in the name of human rights, if in the name of wanting to stop war, one engages in an illegal act, which is akin to warfare, and second, it targets and mostly harms the population, it's illogical. Lastly, the problem with sanctions, unilateral you know, coercive measures, is once a country is put on a sanction list or a company, it's very, very difficult to get off that list. So the question of termination is also very important. Next slide, please. So I'm going to just go very briefly in terms of just some points. So first point in terms of sanctions and their harm, they do kill, right? Uh, and they kill people, particularly in visible ways. They have the same effect perhaps as dropping bombs, but it's not visible, right? Uh, so they devastate economies, they cause disinvestment, they destroy regional cooperation, because one of the issues of sanctions is to actually isolate a country. Think of North Korea inability to have normal relationships with neighbors, right? Or Iran as an example. Um, so it also impairs basic necessities like food, water, energy, and transportation. So very important. These are the basics of life. So there's something called the infrastructure of life, meaning what is the basic necessities, infrastructures that actually allow for a meaningful life, right? Water, healthcare, food, et cetera. So that's what they target. Next slide, please. Sanctions are illegal, not a question. So to engage in unilateral sanctions, and of course to advocate on behalf of unilateral sanctions is actually to engage in international criminality, is to promote international criminality. One of the things that APAC should work towards is actually helping the US uh, society and government on an international realm. Uh, so one of the uh, 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 proposals actually is to push the US towards uh, more rational legal mechanisms of achieving political objectives, foreign policy objectives as well. It's very important to understand. It's not just a question of looking at the target country and protecting them. So U.S. sanctions are illegal under international law. Uh, here you have a quote from Alfred DeZayas, who's an international law and former senior law, uh, senior lawyer with the Human Rights Com uh, Commissioner for Human Rights. Uh, for about 10 years or so, right? So an authoritative figure with respect to uh, this question of its legality or not. And so unilateral, uh, unilateral course of measures are illegal. Unilateral course of measures also go against the UN Charter, very important document. Uh, next slide, please. What are the consequences of, of sanctions? Unilateral course of measures actually have an impact that hurts uh, the most vulnerable members uh, of a society, right? And this is an illustration here of uh, measures and consequences uh, that were put on uh, Venezuela, right? A democratic country from our own uh, hemisphere. And the impact here that you can see of the sanctions over about 100,000 dead, 22% of children become stunted, uh, 2 million 500,000 become food insecure, uh, over 300,000 uh, suffer from chronic disease, uh, patients without access to uh, treatment, because one of the effects of, of unilateral coercive measures, again, the extent of it, how wide of it is a big question, but for Venezuela, it's, uh, it's, it's all encompassing. So what that means is even if Venezuela has the money in order to purchase life uh, 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 saving medicines, it cannot. And all pharmaceuticals and biopharmaceutical companies would be unwilling because of fear of sanctions as an example. Next slide, please. And so this is the last point in terms of termination. So even if one chose this as an avenue and it was successful and it happened to uh, be put on a sanctions list, the question of, of cessation, of termination, when does this end, uh, becomes very problematic, right? 
it becomes politicized. And here's a poster, again, that indicated in the context of Ethiopia um, that HR 66, uh, for instance, uh, 6600, um, uh, stated that uh, the sanctions can last up to 10 years. But it was up to the U.S. government to decide uh, what the metrics were, whether they were satisfied or whether they would be extended. Right. So there's a danger involved in even going for this, even if we absolve the fact that it's illegal, that it has a negative impact on the most vulnerable parts of our population, et cetera. So uh, in summary, unilateral coercive measures should not be a tool whatsoever. Right. Uh, for those reasons. But can sanctions be be a tool? Right. And this is where it gets really, I think, uh, you know, uh, interesting in the sense that the diaspora community is having a discussion about this very much, right? Which is what tools are available in order to protect human rights and to push away from and to promote peace, right? To promote peace and security and to stop ethnic based discrimination in Ethiopia. What tools are available? And so sanctions, uh, for the most part, have been appropriated by powerful states, but sanctions historically have been used uh, from by popular movements and grassroots movements, right? So sanctions from below is what I would call it, um, are a viable mechanism that one can think about as a way of putting pressure on a particular government or isolating a particular government, right? And so sanctions particularly uh, have, have, have uh, their history or genealogy uh, in the case of anti-colonial movements in India, uh, in Ireland, and of course, the paradigmatic example is, of course, the South African fight against um, the South African fight against apartheid, right? And so, uh, several things to consider here when we think about sanctions from below is, of course, the legality question, right? And so, as I've stated, there's only one way in which uh, uh, sanctions can be legal, and that is through the uh, United Nations Security Council system, so the UN, UN system. Uh, so we have, for instance, I think 15 different committees that are already set up today that overlook various sanctions that have been approved by the UN Security Council. All signatory member states are required, again, to follow the writ of the UN Security Council. And that's why it has a very powerful effect as well. So one of the mechanisms by which sanctions can be a route as a viable tool is a legal mechanism that requires then it to be introduced and passed within the UN system through the UN Security Council. So that's one. A second element to think about, which is very important, and this is also very important in the context of, of South Africa, uh, which is the harm principle, right? So the harm principle is important in the sense that uh, one needs to be very cognizant that sanctions uh, are going to have a detrimental effect on a particular society and country. And the ones that are the most harmed are those that are the most vulnerable in a particular society. And so that is something that has to be taken into account. Uh, and so the UN system, again, even if it's legal, nevertheless has its problems. Uh, the the uh, sanctions regime that was put on Iraq during Saddam Hussein was legal, but it has a detrimental effect on Iraqi society, uh, particularly children. So lastly is the question of termination that we should really think can you, about. Can you wrap up please, okay? So very, uh, how many minutes do I have? You have about two minutes. Two minutes, give me five and I'll finish it up, okay. So lastly is the question of termination. Uh, and I think termination is again, very important in the UN system. There's mechanisms by which uh, this uh, question of termination uh, can be addressed. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. So boycotts are, are, I think, a very interesting and viable also tool that's available. In the context of, of discussion about uh, available tools, boycotts and divestments, boycotts are important. And in fact, uh, the theoretician, if you will, Nelson Mandela, advocated for boycotts in the 1950s because boycotts were very, very easy to generate, to use as a practical tool in order uh, to allow people that did not have direct access to power to actually have some impact, right? So I think that is a very important element in terms of, of, of the practical implications of uh, a practical tool of, 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 um, of boycotts and, and its importance. Uh, the other element I think which is important in terms of 
uh, boycotts, and it's a practical tool, is that it can target specific political institutions and political bodies, right? So one of the things to think about is in terms of boycotts as both economic boycotts and political boycotts as well. So one of the uh, importance to think in terms of a practical tool is that it can ask for and remove people from the from the political system. Why? Because it can disrupt the regular flow of politics. And here we can talk about the context of Ethiopian ruling governance, who is a participating member of it, and the way in which some participate and some could be asked not to participate, right? And the other aspect, of course, is the economic system. And, and as mentioned earlier, how can there be a disengagement that does it that does not allow the regular flow of economic resources. So remittances could be one of them as well. And so that is the way in which boycotts can can operate. Another element that's very uh, uh, favorable in terms of boycotts is the awareness level, public awareness level, and the importance in the context of either a racialized or ethnicized society for a very important coming together. Right, a solidarity across ethnic bases, and so boycotts are very effective in that sense, uh, raising consciousness and solidarity. The third element is about crossover. Boycotts can work very well with other forms of resistance and civil disobedience. One of which uh, that was uh, um, recommended by Nelson Mandela and the ANC, African National Congress, in the context of the fight against apartheid, were strikes. Right, strikes. Uh, next slide, please. And I'll just wrap up very quickly. Um, so there's two models that we can think of in terms of, uh, of uh, bringing together boycotts, divestment, and sanctions. Boycotts and divestments particularly look at the breaking of flows, economic flows, political flows, the targeting of companies, shareholders, both domestic and international, that in some way are involved in direct uh, funding and relationship with entities that are involved in the violation of human rights. And so the BDS movement around Palestinian rights is a great illustration of a social grassroots movement that's developed. Uh, the BDS movement around, again, South Africa, apartheid South Africa is another model that we can talk about and think about. Maybe in the context of if there's an opportunity for questions or discussions, we can we can discuss. Uh, maybe going to the conclusion, um, since I'm a little bit over time. Uh, just the last slide, please. So these are just illustrations of actual boycotts that are already happening and happened in Ethiopia in the context during the EPRDF era that are very effective. H&M uh, is an example of an international company that was sourcing cotton for its manufacturing uh, and, of course, exporting it out of Ethiopia. But it was the cotton was being produced on land in which people have been dispossessed, the so-called land grabs. And so this way of targeting companies and having the companies change their behavior is one of the strategies in terms of thinking about boycotts and divestments. Uh, if you can go to the concluding um, slide, is the last slide, and I'll just wrap up my remarks. So generally, when we talk about sanctions in Ma'akab, uh, the conclusion that I derive is simply to say no, that unilateral coercive measures are not the path that one should take. But rather, when we think of the tools that are available, um, sanctions from below, uh, again, short term and long term, boycotts, divestment are strategies that are easy to use with a very low bar. Uh, they are practical and perhaps effective. Uh, and long term sanctions, which require cooperation and help from state actors, um, take a long term sort of view. And so one can also think in terms of those uh, limitations when you think about what tools to use and how to combine them, et cetera. So these are simply ways to think about, you know, the um, the tools that one can use with respect to ethnic discrimination and human rights violations in Ethiopia. But the key things once again, to consider is always to uh, think about the principle of harm and secondarily, the principle of effectiveness. Uh, just because one has sanctions doesn't mean that it works. 
There's sanctions on Syria, it doesn't work. On Iran, for over 30 years, it doesn't work, et cetera. Uh, lastly, sequential and contextual understanding. So this has to be designed and understood in the context of Ethiopia's economic and political situation, and not simply as a blanket sort of cookie cutter uh, sort of um, uh, illustration that one can copy. Uh, so this is a very broad, very surface level sort of introduction and discussion on this topic. And uh, so I hope uh, that was uh, uh, that was useful. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Biniam. Um, lots of controversial statements. A lot of people have uh, lots of comments to what you said, but we will wait until everyone has uh, spoken. And now uh, it's Jeff, Jeff Pierce. So I just have to say this. When I asked Jeff to send me his bio, he sent me something. I just could not use it the way he sent it. I'll just read the first sentence so you guys will understand. He said, I was born a child. After some false start, he eventually became an adult. So, okay. So after that, I decided I have to kind of research a little bit. But we don't need a lot to research who Jeff Pierce is. He's a journalist. He's a historian. He's a novelist. He's an editor. And he also says he's a career surrealist. And he's uh, interviewed Kurdish army commander in Iraq. Uh, he has taught journalism in Myanmar. He has also written a lot of in investigative work on gangs. But what he's mostly interesting to us Ethiopians is he has written books on Ethiopia and Africa. He's the author of Prevail. He's also the author of The Gifts of Africa, Winged Bull and many articles on Ethiopia. He's a, he has shown himself to be a friend of the Ethiopian people. He has been uh, in Ethiopia and has uh, done a lot of things to show the atrocities of the TPLF and for that we are forever thankful to him. I'm gonna go very quickly because unfortunately I have another obligation afterwards. Uh, please apologize, I'll apologize here because I'm reading off my computer. I don't have a teleprompter like these other internet people. Um, I'll make it very clear from the start. I only speak for myself. If people want to take my suggestions, great. I was invited to talk here today because a small circle of high profile folks, what I call the leaders of the resistance in the diaspora, liked some of what I had to say in a closed session. And that is a truly wonderful thing that proves my point. Nation is not a concept that's restricted by geography and borders. Ethiopians still think of themselves as Ethiopians when they live abroad. And while I can never be one of you, you have been so kind to include me in your struggles. And that inclusivity, that sense of nationhood abroad puts the lie to the idea that only those within the country have a stake or a right to weigh in. The Abbey government was happy as hell to call everyone for a homecoming when it suited its purpose, and folks were glad to do it. Now they're told to mind your own business. Not this time, we'll listen only to our captives. Oops, uh, the people we have here. To hell with that. Not good enough. Mesfin kindly sent me the results of the survey, but days before I received it, I was already thinking, okay, this might be useful, perhaps? I say perhaps because for the internet, you will always have a few bad faith trolls weighing in to try to skew the numbers. And that got me thinking, well, wait a minute, this might be good enough for one or two insights, but it can't tell us what to do. There's a higher duty here. So let me explain what I mean by that. I was invited down to Atlanta a while back for a book event. And as usual, I brought home a couple of books. Hope you can see these. Very cool. Um, and one of them was a history of the Freedom Riders. And if you asked most Black people in America at the time, in the 1960s, hey, do you think it would be a good idea to go down in a bus through the Deep South and confront rednecks and bigots at diner tables? Most people would say, are you delusional? Are you insane? But that's exactly what they did because there was a higher duty. What is so different in the situation of Ethiopia? You have an ethnic population being held hostage in a geographic area. They won't let you live. They won't let you leave. They're shooting people at churches and mosques. 
Think about that time MLK and his followers had to take refuge in the First Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama, and an angry mob waited for anyone to step outside. Only in Ethiopia, no federal army will come to your rescue. I have things to say to both the diaspora community and the people living in Ethiopia if they're checking in to watch this or they see it later. And I'll go back and forth and skip from one to the other and back again because you need closer ties and connections to work together. Some of what I say will be obvious, and maybe you're already doing what I suggest, but it still needs to be talked about out in the open for all to hear. It's for those who don't know, and for those who do, it tells you back in the motherland that we haven't forgotten you, that we are devoting tactical and strategic thinking and effort to helping you. You, all of you on both sides are needed. Only this week, the Ethiopian American Development Council pointed out how Daniel Bekele's shop, the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission, just outright refuses to publish its reports in English. Only he tweets in English when he decides it's important enough. And for the life of me, I can't figure out why. But the point is everyone recognizes we need good, solid, clear translations of material in English. So if you have the time, please do this. But do it in a disciplined way. Don't just slap it on Twitter or Facebook and think your job is done. It ain't. When you do that, you're not helping anyone because your post can be lost in this great ocean of data. You need to send it through DMs or at least tag one of those folks that they can verify the translation and give it a boost, give it to Nebu Asfa, give it to Mesfen, give it to Wasi, and they'll look at it and pass it on because they've got the followings. They can amplify it. Boycotts. Yes, please. But I have some thoughts about that. <clears throat> if you're in Addis or wherever and try this, don't show up at the business itself in a small protest cluster because the authorities will be sure to come by and beat you up and then arrest you. Instead, save the big signs calling out the companies for large demonstrations where we can maximize the attention. If you're in North America or Europe, same thing. Save the signs for the pro big protest marches where they can be seen and photographed and make a difference. Uh, there was an example about cotton earlier. You're not ready for that yet. You've got to build the momentum and have the numbers before you can go after a big game like that. But start with small companies. It starts the ball rolling. If by some miracle media shows up, the reporter goes, hey, they're picking on this castle or castle winery in Aromia. Let's go get a comment. And that puts the winery on the spot. Now it's a case of, uh, 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 and they'll be stuck because whether they respond or not, we have got attention for the issue. I'll leave it for others, others to talk about reroute remittance because they know far better about that than I do. I fully support this. I'm already on public record for saying sanctions are pointless and dumb and will not work. And I wrote a whole article about that and you can look it up on Medium or Substack, but boycotts can be effective. But what we really need, in my own humble opinion, is for you in the diaspora to push and tweet and post and talk about the Constitution. Get rid of this shambling Frankenstein monster that caused so much heartache and death. Get rid of it. Don't let the government try to shelve this discussion and don't let it be a topic only for their cherry-picked authorities or their partners in crime at the TPLF or OLF or anyone else. It needs to be thrown out and a new one made. I'm in Canada. We had to overhaul our constitution decades ago, and the country has a few of the top experts on constitutional law in the world here, more in Europe and Asia. Why aren't we pushing for an international convention on this? You are the diaspora. You are APAC and ECNAS and the Ethiopian American Development Council. Make some noise. Hold a conference for it in Frankfurt or in D.C. or London, but push for it to happen. And part and parcel of that for the home team and the diaspora is to make stronger and more public bonds between Christians and Muslims. They are shooting at all of you. Whether you pray to Jesus or face east towards Mecca, they have made you the enemy and you have common cause. We've talked about forming ties, but what is the tangible practical action on this? Please make it happen. If a mosque is demolished, Christians should be out in the streets and forming a protective ring around Muslims who gather in that rubble and lay down their mats to pray. That's a demonstration, but that's also faith. 
Muslims should be there to help their Christian brothers and sisters in a similar way. I've written it down and said it before. I'll say it again. A protest march is not the goal. That's an event. A big demonstration is not the goal. It's an event. It might be news for a day, and then where are you? You're back to square one unless you plan these demonstrations and protests and actions to have a momentum that puts pressure on those in power. They have to add up to something and take you where you need to go. Changing the Constitution, that's a goal. Getting Abby out of office, that's the goal. Getting permanent protection for Amhara and better treatment for Afar and other targeted ethnic groups, that's the goal. Build the momentum. As I say, if you know it, you know this. So apologies to those who do, but I suspect a good number of folks don't know back home or here or in Europe. And why should they know guerrilla tactics of underground resistance and protest? So I'm talking to them. I am not here to reassure you that it's going to be all right. I don't know that. My single warm and fuzzy message is that you are not alone and that Ethiopia lives and breathes in the heart of every person who can still see green and yellow and bright, cheerful red and not black and blue and bleeding crimson. I told these leaders in our little Zoom session that they are criminals now. Might as well face it. You think you can grab a flight home on Ethiopian Airlines and go back in the next year or so? Hell no, they have their names. If they will shoot people outside a mosque or a church, they will arrest your asses. You are outlaws now, so be outlaws. That's the big difference between Ferengi hypocrites like Alex DeWall and Fungus Davison and Andrew DeCourt and others who pretend they're analyzing Ethiopia, when in fact they're screwing around behind the scenes to see how much trouble they can cause to destabilize the country. Well, now you want regime change and you need it, so I'm telling you straight out, go do some crimes. When they attack creative artists, when they attack the most basic things you do in life are deemed a crime, and you're threatened with lethal force, you are entitled, damn it, you have an obligation to liberate yourself through any means at your disposal. Nonviolent protest for civil rights is not passive. It can be confrontational. It can be subversive. But it's deliberately illegal because it serves a higher duty. If they are starving your people by denying them the essentials for the soil, steal that fertilizer. If you work for some business and have access to fertilizer for farms, steal it. That's right. You heard me. Steal the damn thing if you can get away with it and arrange to smuggle it to those farmers who need it. This past week, the Western media cranked up their old narratives, twisting a story, which I suspect has some legitimacy, but it will take us a while to find out the real truth. And it sure is interesting how Martin Plout is acting as a sock puppet for USAID. And it's about corruption in terms of food aid being stolen or moved elsewhere. And once again, a hysterical note of Tigray's in trouble. And that's all they give a shit about. Nothing about Afar. Nothing about the Amhara region. So if you guys can figure out a trafficking network to get fertilizer to those farmers who need it, go for it. If you're already doing it, fantastic. But we need the word to get out, to give folks hope that part in the expression, shit is getting done. Don't physically hurt people, don't slander people, but go do crimes of defiance because your government is already hauling journalists off the street. You have uniformed thugs ramming you in the back with rifle butts and massacring people in remote areas. Yes, there are risks. Only you personally can decide what you're comfortable with and how to measure those risks to yourself, to your family. And who am I to say this? I was there to cover a war. I went to the war zones, but I was never in much danger. My friends were in danger. They wanted to kill one of them and try to lure him to his own assassination. But I was fine. And here I am. I'm home again and safe and far away on my fat ass. All I can risk at the moment for you is my personal reputation and credibility and my livelihood. That's all I can offer. Maybe five times a day, a troll replies on Twitter, you're white, you're not African, stay out of it. Or who are you to comment? Well, they asked me. I was invited. And if I'm going to get the same nonsense of who are you, I might as well say what's really on my mind. These are my suggestions. And they're based on 40 plus years of working in media and communications. Take them or leave them. A civil rights campaign is always a matter of individual conscience and choice. No one can tell you what to do. 
You can help the resistance in big ways and small ones, but it's up to you. What I can say is that when soldiers or cops or anyone in a uniform threatens and aims a gun at you, when they demolish your homes and massacre whole communities, they have handed you the moral license to do what needs to be done. You can put the damn fear into the authorities with the power of your marches and the volume of your voices, but you need to be smart about it. When the thugs in uniform come for your friends, don't scream and make a scene, fall back and take their damn photo with your cell phone and run. Take that video footage of these individual cops or soldiers and then wallpaper the fucking internet with their face. Make it so that we can track down their names and then spread those names all over the place. A line of soldiers or cops in a city or a town is a mob, a gang. Put individual faces out on the internet, put their names if you can through contacts or Twitter replies, and you can cut them away from the herd. These authority figures are used against demonstrations and activists put fear into others to stop them from emulating the good example. So turn it around, make their faces public, so that everybody knows who's the narc, who's the cop, who's the informant, even when they're off duty and out of uniform, shame the hell out of them. Because that's step one for conversion. We want them either neutralized or on our side. You are the people of Ethiopia and you are your own best intelligence network. And network is more than just what works on your damn phone. If you have a family member who is in the police or the army, you owe it to yourself and them to try to get the truth across, to challenge them gently and at your own comfort level to ask, why are you doing this? Why are you hurting your own people? The goal is converts. We need them. The end goal is not war among yourselves, but to win a country for all. The smallest gesture of protest can take on larger symbolic meaning, which can help morale. Look at what Philagot Abraham and others did at the Guma Film Awards this week. Yes, I've heard she was arrested. Presumably, she must have known there was a risk of that, and she chose to take that risk, which is why we should honor her bravery and follow her example. I'm told the event's organizer was arrested too, and I hope I'm pronouncing his name properly, Jonas Berhane Moa uh, Mua. But look at how desperate they've become to do that. Of course, there are risks, but these examples also show how near things are to the tipping point. At my cadre, the bastards took spray paint and marked houses for where they should kill Amhara. It's time to flip the script. If you've got spray paint, get yourself a good hoodie and dark trousers and take the minimal risk and go out and tag Amhara on a government office or a landmark. Let them know Amhara are here to stay and not going anywhere. Take their mark of fear and shove it back in their faces. Like I said, maybe you're already doing these stunts and tactics, such as that great display at the Film Awards. I don't know. They're not being talked about enough, and we need the public chatter about them because this campaign for your civil rights, this campaign to get you a new government that respects your rights, is a communications campaign. I've studied history, and I know public relations and communications. I know that Mercury, when it was hired, did a piss-poor, completely incompetent job. They were useless. I know the way it's going to work. The U.S. media will only show up when they realize Abby is cooked and on his way out. Check history. The Americans do this with every Shah, South American president, African strongman who is close to being ousted. They've supported so many dictators or worked with them, and then when they're in trouble, they cut them loose. Only then do they cozy up to the new incoming administration. They want to know you are a political force that is here to stay. They won't show you respect. They won't give you attention until you make it crystal clear they have to acknowledge you. Only then will you get media coverage in the West, which will give a hard shove to the Western gardeners that they must deal with you. And I'm pushing all this for a bigger reason. The last thing anyone wants is the clock to turn back to 1994 and have might means right. There must always be a civilian political wing supported by ordinary Ethiopians. When you finally get a change in government, you want it to be a civilian government representing the people. All the people, not just Tigrayans or Romos or Amhara or Garagi or Afar, everyone. 
what began as a time of so much promise was shattered and became an era of war. And now it's turning into this reign of greed and hubris and megalomania and ethnic cleansing. As I say, I can't stay for the rest of our event. I have another obligation, but I want to say in closing, don't give in to despair. I like sometimes to quote this great labor activist in the States. His name was Joe Hill. They framed him for murder, put him in a chair with a paper target, and a firing squad shot him like he was a soldier. And he was one for human rights. And before they killed him, he told his friends, don't mourn, organize. You each can make a contribution. Each of you can be a force for positive change. Join the resistance. Decide how you can help. You are the Arbanoch, fighting in ways big and small to create the Ethiopia you deserve. And I will keep on writing and saying this over and over until you win. Resist, endure, prevail. Thank you very much. That's my, that's my time. At this time, I would like to invite Chris Drum. Uh, Chris is, uh, uh, his involvement in politics began with 1980's Pennsylvania primary as a statewide campus coordinator for Senator Edward Kennedy, uh, his campaign for presidency. The effort yielded not only a primary victory, but lifelong friendships with uh, Patrick Kennedy and Ed Randall. Uh, he works in several other campaigns followed. And in 1987, he, uh, Chris was elected leader of Philadelphia 63rd Ward, the youngest person to ever hold that title. And he's held that title many times for the last 20 decades. Uh, professionally, he, uh, he led uh, uh, politics, led drum to positions with Philadelphia City Council, the Delaware River, Delaware River Port Authority and the Office of Congressman Robert Barsky. Drum began his career as a lobbyist at St. Joseph's University, where he served as special advisor to the president and vice president in government affairs. Uh, he was instrumental in securing 12.6 million federal funding towards the construction of the National Center for Food Marketing. Uh, Drum spent the last 20 years leading government affairs and a team of over 25 uh, at Amri Health Caritas, one of America's largest managed care organizations. And he also, um, yeah. So while he was at Ami uh, Caritas, he uh, created the, uh, the, the Amory Health Caritas PAC, an, uh, an employee funded political action committee, which now raises and disperses $150,000 annually. So with this, Chris, uh, I invite you to speak, and he, your and Chris's focus is going to be on the Ethiopian caucus and the diaspora's role. Ten minutes for Chris. Wasi, thank you so much for that introduction. As Wasi noted, my name is Christopher Drum, and I am a lobbyist. Um, I've been at this for some time, as Wasi noted. Also, I worked for Senator Ted Kennedy when he ran for president in 1980, which uh, led to some votes and a lot of stories and a lot of friendships. Uh, that was my first political activity outside of my father having been involved in the labor movement for years. Uh, my two longest engagements in lobbying and two more engagements are St. Joe's uh, University, where I was special assistant to the president and VP for government affairs, and AmeriHealth Caritas, where I served for 20 years as SVP for government affairs and played an important role in bringing that company's revenues from $2 billion to $20 billion annually. Uh, I'm honored and pleased to be included in APAC's efforts, which uh, are so important, and uh, happy to be retained by the American Ethiopian Public Affairs Committee. My firm is Drum and Daughters. I am the father of four daughters. Um, it is a registered Pennsylvania limited liability corporation. It was formed earlier this year when I retired from Memorial Health Caritas. I'm pleased to report that my first client is AmeriHealth Caritas. And uh, important to note that we are quite active both in Washington, D.C. and in Pennsylvania State Capitol, Harrisburg. I'm going to share my, my screen if I could. You see. Much of my 
focus with APAC will be on the U.S. House Ethiopian American Caucus. Now let's do current membership. We'll take a look at the uh, at the uh, purpose. This is the uh, this is the organization's description. This is on file with the clerk, and it's our purpose uh, working to strengthen. Uh, Working to strengthen the relationship between the U.S. and Ethiopia, and serving as the legislative voice for Ethiopian Americans across the United States, the caucus serves the Ethiopian American community as it continues to grow in population and influence and supports the community's interests both here and in Ethiopia. It educates members on issues related to Ethiopia and the Horn of Africa. That's our goal. So let's take a look at the Ethiopian American caucus as it exists today. As Mesbin noted, using the same slide, there are 12 members. This slide shows 13, I believe, because they count uh, Congresswoman Kamlager of California twice, using both her maiden and married name. So we'll talk to the clerk about that. Uh, the current membership is, is strong, but demonstrates at least two anomalies. One is a partisan anomaly. 10 of our 12 members are members of the Democratic Party. That is to say, members of the House Minority Party. Just two are Republican or members of the House Majority Party. And of course, majority means a great deal in the U.S. House of Representatives. There's also a geographical anomaly we're looking at, and that is uh, five of our 12 members are Californians, which is uh, a little dispro uh, somewhat disproportionate. So my goal or my charge is to engage in the reinvigoration of the Congressional Ethiopian Caucus as currently constructed. And we'll do this by reaching out to each of the current members to thank them for their past involvement and then begin a regular cadence of communications with these current members. In addition, we're going to grow the uh, caucus and address our current anomalies by leveraging uh, past political activities Building on the successes of the midterm election, which Mesbin did a good job describing, uh, we're going to ask current members to recruit additional members on our behalf. In terms of targets, we're going to identify representatives of congressional districts with large Ethiopian populations, and there are several. Um, we're also going to target, um, as a first tier opportunity, members of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. That is the committee charged with guiding the relations of the United States uh, with foreign nations. We're also going to target a committee members. That is the most prestigious committees in the U.S. House. And this will elevate our credibility and prestige within the, uh, the world of the United States Congress. And those a, committee a committees we intend to focus on are include appropriations, energy and commerce, roles and ways and means. Generally, the um, the select committees in the House, it's the most prestigious, the hardest to get on, the most desired. So between foreign affairs and target and the eight committee members, we're looking to expand our, our reach. That's we've identified, if, if it makes sense, but I can go into the uh, targets. On House rules, we identified two members, um, Russian Thaler, a Pennsylvania Republican, Scanlon of Pennsylvania, uh, Democratic. On foreign affairs, we've identified six targets, uh, Smith of New Jersey Republican, Perry of Pennsylvania Republican, Kane of New Jersey Republican, and then three Democrats, Susan Wilde of Pennsylvania, Andy Kim of New Jersey, Madeline Dean of Pennsylvania. These are not exactly low hanging fruits, but the most the greatest opportunity is represented by these members currently. On appropriations, we're going to focus on Matt Cartwright, Democrat of Pennsylvania, for whom my daughter worked for a number of years. And then on Ways and Means Committee, um, we have seven targets, three Republican and four Democratic. Uh, Mr. Kelly of Pennsylvania, Republican. Mr. Fitzpatrick of Pennsylvania, Republican. Lloyd Smucker of Pennsylvania, Republican. Richie Neal, the ranking Democratic member of Massachusetts with whom uh, our dear friend, Brendan Boyle has a strong relationship. Bill, Bill Pascrell, Democrat of New Jersey. 
Dwight Evans, Democrat of Pennsylvania, and Jimmy Panetta, Democrat of California. So the work will be focused on, again, reinvigorating and strengthening the U.S. House American Ethiopian Caucus. Has been anything to add or anything I've missed? We're also on energy and commerce. I apologize. Lisa Blunt Rochester of Delaware. We're focusing on Democrats. Yeah. No, that's. Uh, I think that's excellent. Thank you, Chris. Great. Thank you, Mas. To see the speaker, the the participants now, and if they raise their hands, we would take questions. Zeke has the first question. Go ahead, Zeke. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. My question is, I think it's a, a great uh, session. Uh, I have some uh, comments when the professor was uh, giving us, uh, uh, making his point on how sanctions are bad and stuff. I think before we even, at, at, at the conclusion, he also admits that we need to do whatever we are doing based on the, the concrete reality in each country. So what APAC needs to, to do before you reset your priorities for next year is uh, when you say uh, your agenda is a pro-Ethiopia agenda, we, we don't need to do that here today. But your board and the leaders of the different chapters, maybe a couple of people from each chapter need to sit down and we need to redefine what a pro-Ethiopia agenda is. But the pro-Ethiopia agenda last year might not be a pro-Ethiopia agenda today. So is asking for the Abi regime to go a pro-Ethiopia agenda or that's not our responsibility for regime change? There are all kinds of discussions we can do. So if you want the majority of the diaspora Ethiopians to rally around you and raise not just a million dollar a year, uh, or 500,000 a year, million dollar an election cycle as part of restating the priorities of APAC should be revisiting what your mission is as well as how you define a pro-Ethiopia agenda. And I try to explain to uh, uh, Professor Biniam that uh, everything he talked about sanction is a perfect solution for a run of the mill country like Kenya or Botswana or some third world country. That will not work for Nazi Germany or it will not work for the fascist regime of Italy. So, APAC and its followers and its supporters must decide what kind of regime we have in Ethiopia and what the solution should be. How are we going to articulate with the elected officials, the government officials of each country we, we live in, what their, their support is going to be, what, what kind of policy we want them to advance? We have to realize what the situation is and what the solution should be. To make it a pro-Ethiopia agenda, there has to be a democratic Ethiopia where nobody is killed on a daily basis. I mean, he cannot lecture me about sanction being bad when they, the Ethiopian government has sanctioned every Amhara not to come to Addis Ababa. When the Ethiopian government has sanctioned the entire 40 million people Amharas not to get fertilizer. We're talking about how we should be careful about sanctions. So we need to decide where we are. That's all I got. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you um, um... Zeke. 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 <laughs> thank you, Zeke. Uh, so okay. next is Yom and then Naaman. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm, um, I want to express my personal opinion, not uh, EPAC uh, positions, but uh, I want to say that in the past two years, EPAC has worked hard, very hard uh, to prevent sanctions against Ethiopia. We were, uh, and we also, an EPAC is not for uh, sanctions. We don't want the people to be hurt. We don't want the, the, uh, the, the average Ethiopian worker to lose their jobs. However, the people who are violating human rights in Ethiopia is the government of Ethiopia itself. Uh, there is ethnic-based killings, 
uh, uh, religious based killing, demolition of houses, 500,000 people, like, like you said, uh, Wasi, uh, have lost their homes around uh, Addis Ababa. So what are we going to do? If we are for pro Ethiopia, are we going to keep quiet when people are being killed? Are we going to keep quiet when over 4.3 million people are displaced? So how are we going to going to proceed from now on? If because actually what is happening in Ethiopia is destabilizing the whole country. It's it's making it difficult for us to 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 support. Uh, all the campaigns that are going on right now. So, so what I'm uh, saying is that we have to do something to stop this human rights violations in Ethiopia, the senseless killings, uh, displacements. So, so we have to apply some kind of conditions uh, to, to pressure the Ethiopian government uh, to respect human rights and respect, uh, uh, and also this ethnic-based killing. So uh, that's, this is what I wanted to say, thank you. Thank you, Yom. So, so before I let Naman speak, I do want to, I do have one comment myself. And, and that is, I mean, I totally agree with both what uh, uh, Zeke said and, 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 and you too, Yom. Uh, part of the issue for us is, I mean, we know how we struggled not to have the sanctions put on Ethiopia. I mean, nobody needs to tell us about that. But when you say that people will suffer if these things happen right now, the people are suffering as it is right now. I mean, I went to the IDP camps in Dabra Burhan where nothing is being done by the government, nothing. People are starving, it's okay, let them starve, let them die. The sanctions on the people, it's not just the Amaras coming into Addis, is already happening through the Ethiopian government. And it is fascistic, it is fascism. This is not a place where you can just march and demonstrate and do what you do and be okay. They'll just shoot and kill and, and, and that's what they do. So I do want uh, to add one thing, which I find very interesting. I always go back to our history because our ancestors knew well how to fight and protect themselves. When the fascists occupied Ethiopia, Addis Ababa was burnt to the ground. Who burnt Addis Ababa to the ground? That was Ras Abdel, Ras Abdel the, the, the patriot, the warrior, because he did not want to leave that city to the fascists at the time. So people go through those kinds of things, even harming themselves to get rid of tyranny and to get rid of dictatorship. Sanctions do harm, may harm people. And, but in the case of Ethiopia, they will get rid of the government because Abiy's government is a weak government. It's not like the other governments. It's very, very weak. It's a government that does not know how to rule, that does not know, that doesn't even know how to, <laughs> how to run its army or bureaucracy. So I do believe, and, and I know this, I'm, 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 I'm I'm articulating aside, but that's me, Wasi, personally. This is what I feel. I do believe sanctions would work, but it's not just about sanctions. It's at all levels, different kinds of things that we can do. We can talk about remittance. We can talk about boycott, like boycotting the Ethiopian airlines for a certain time. That we would, those are things that the government would feel. So these, this is my two cents. I love that we're having this discussion. It just shows that APEC is very deliberate on how we do things. We don't just think, take things easily and, and just make, make some decisions, but this is my opinion. So now um, it's Naaman, Mespin, and then Binyam. Okay, Naaman, go ahead. Unmuted. Unmute. Okay. Go ahead. It says it's unmuted here, but I go ahead, Nam, and you unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. For, uh, first, I would like to thank all the presenters for excellent articulation of their respective presentations. Mm, and then I would like to make a comment with regard to sanctions. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we really have to come to terms with the obtaining condition in Ethiopia. Uh, in, on all fronts, this government is turning into a dictatorship of the fascistic kind, as Wasi said. Uh, 
it is a deliberate design to impose an ethnocracy. Uh, it's uh, a misrule, mismanagement of the economy. Ethiopia is smart in economic, political, security crisis, primarily stemming from what the government is doing and not doing. This government, as Wasi said, I agree with her, is very vulnerable. It's a weak government. We have much, 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 much details that we can elaborate, but we don't have time to do so now. Sanctions, comprehensive sanctions may hurt the poor and the vulnerable uh, sector of the society. But however, selective targeted sanctions are imperative. Namely, for example, APAC Khan, after due diligence and study, can aggressively push in the US legislature for human rights, transparency, accountability as conditions for all economic assistance, not including uh, the humanitarian assistance. We can also push for magnetism, ask the act for to hold violators of human rights uh, of this region, to hold them accountable, security officials who are uh, committing uh, atrocities, including torture. Now, the prime minister, as you all recall, promised that torture would not be the rule as it used to be during the 27 years of TPLF's impunity, the regime of the TPLF. But now today, there is torture, rampant torture of Amara prisoners and other political prisoners and uh, journalists. The Ethiopian people, in fact, want us to have gotten several messages from Ethiopia that we should strengthen the current campaign for sanctions. But what kind of sanctions? EPAC can do due diligence and present it to US Congress as part of its legislative agenda, namely respect for human rights, accountability, transparency have to be verified before economic assistance, loans, and uh, grants. That must be one of the strategic weapons we can employ to put pressure on this government. Every country, as Zik uh, earlier said, has specific features. Not, uh, it's not uh, one uh, size fits all situation. We have a situation in Ethiopia, a unique situation where the regime is extremely vulnerable. Right now, they have severe foreign currency and economic crunch. They cannot meet even the, the budget. So uh, we have to be very sensitive for the needs of the people so that the, the average Ethiopian, the people at large, are not made to suffer. However, there are uh, mechanisms and, and uh, uh, conditions that we can present to U.S. Congress to the, the, the yeah, yeah, for for them to attach specific conditions before uh, giving aid, economic assistance, and grants and loans to the government of Ethiopia. That's one of the few weapons we have to deploy. Uh, there are other, the, even in South Africa, as you all recall, for example. Divestment of companies was the biggest leverage that the struggle for liberation and freedom uh, employed. And it worked more than the armed struggle, more than the other uh, kind of forms of struggle. So we should not uh, base our uh, uh, recommendations and uh, uh, direction on based on the experience of few countries where sanctions uh, affected the average people, the masses. We should study the unique features of Ethiopia and come up with a set of tools and interventions to make an impact, to put pressure on this regime that's doing everything that was said earlier by all of you. So this is a very dangerous trajectory in Ethiopia right now. It has to be stopped by all means necessary. Unless we stop it, not only in Ethiopia, the region will be destabilized. 
because these people are delusional. These people are narcissistic, including the prime minister, primarily the prime minister. They have to be stopped. And we know they are vulnerable. But as Wasi said, we have much information on the security, bureaucracy, and the military. What he says and claims and the reality is different. So they are vulnerable. Uh, and the Ethiopian people defend, they depend on the diaspora, especially those of us in the US, to come up with the right interventions to make an impact and make force this region towards uh, what was promised. Human rights, rule of law, equality, no ethnocracy, no domination, no hegemony, no impunity, accountability, transparency. So I uh, really plead with all members of APAC to really consider the situation, not be bogged down by a fear of sanction uh, or targeted sanction impacting all Ethiopians or the, 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 those who are most vulnerable, the, the masses. Thank you. Thank you. Mesfin? No, no, let, let's Professor Biniam go. Uh, Professor okay. Biniam, if, if you, uh, can you please take, let him take as, as much time as he wants, as he okay. needs, and we, we, we need to hear from him. Okay. Go ahead, please. Okay, um, so thank you. Um, yeah, I think those are very valid points, you know, uh, very valid points from all um, uh, the people that just spoke. Now, it's important to make a distinction. Uh, sometimes people listen to what they want to listen, but forget to listen to other things in, for instance, what I was talking about. So when I talk about sanctions as no, sanctions that is unilaterally applied. So as an example, uh, sanctions that can be unilaterally applied by the United States are illegal. What does that mean? That means other countries are not going to participate. That's what it means. So look at these sanctions, forget Ethiopia, the stakes for the United States to make sure that other countries actually follow, right? And obey the sanctions that the US has decided to put on a country for whatever reasons on Russia, much more important for US uh, global, uh, let's say, uh, strategy. Uh, the majority of the world is not participating in that sanctions regime. And sanctions are ineffectual in that sanctions regime, the most that's ever been put on a country in the history of sanctions. So what I'm trying to say is that sanctions to unilateral, which are illegal, no. Sanctions that are legal through the UN system that would require a state to actually be a sponsor, to bring it up in the Security Council and to vote. I think in the questions is interesting. It says, we don't trust the Security Council. Of course, it's, it's politicized. So which countries would be more amenable to supporting sanctions on Ethiopia through the UN Security Council system in order to protect the population. So everything that we talked about, I don't think it's relevant for all of us to make a laundry list of all the problems that are happening in Ethiopia. We all know that. The question for today and the discussion that we were having was what are the tools? How can we achieve this? And what are the objectives? So when Zeke, for instance, is talking about articulating what it means to be pro-Ethiopian, meaning what are the objectives? The BDS movement for the Palestinian movement for rights has three specific objectives. The South African movement uh, led by the ANC had the Freedom Charter, about 10 specific points that they wanted as an objective. So the tools that were used to reach that objective were sanctions, boycotts, divestments. How do they work? So when we talk about sanctions, there's an assumption, for instance, let's say uh, we take the first route, right? Unilateral coercive measures. And APAC then decides to lobby the US government to try to pass this. What makes you sure that the US has any interest in doing so? The US interest is not in the promotion of democracy or human rights. The US has national interests on the African continent. One of the things that we were focused and discussing on in the previous two years was to actually point out how US national interest was actually against the human rights, the sovereignty of Ethiopia, right? And we were trying to uh, avail policymakers of this very fact. 
how do you do it? Ahun enna tolo tolo bet girgidaw sambalet. You rush because you're angry. There are things that are happening. Every single one of us are angry. Every single one of us have losses. That is not the question. But the question is how, what strategy to deploy, in what way, and when. So we need to act now, right? So there's a short term and there's a long term. So when you act now, immediately, housing demolitions around Addis Ababa, the demolition of religious institutions, Masjids, 19, the killing of, 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 uh, of faithful and Anwar Masjid, uh, the attempt to break the Orthodox Church, the attempt to stop people on the basis of ethnicity from entering Addis Ababa, the essentially the decision not to reconstruct the devastation in northern Ethiopia, Amara, Afar, Tigray, leaving them. Look at the budget, this year's budget, right? There are many things we can point out that are problematic. The question is, how can we act as quickly as possible? There's millions of displaced people. These displaced people are living in very difficult circumstances right now. Debra Burhan, in camps. How do they make injera? Not enough mitad, as an example. Just very basic. Are they protected from the elements? So we need to act in terms of thinking short term. What is more effective? Uh, uh, so to lobby the U.S. government, to change their minds, to make sure that their national interest is going to be achieved uh, with the grassroots movement that is trying to achieve human rights in Ethiopia takes time. Until then, what do you do? No boycotts, no divestments. So part of the discussion that we're having is looking at what tools do we have on the table? And from these tools, how can we achieve these objectives? The objective of which I've never mentioned because uh, these objectives are articulated by organizations like APAC and other civic organizations, a consensus, right? Uh, th this means you want a new Ethiopia. The type of Ethiopia that we have today is a nightmare. No question about it. What kind of new Ethiopia, what kind of new politics is it that we want? That is the objective that one is going to articulate, right? So I think that is, a, that is the, the, the point to take. It's very important to remember, um, you know, those that are watching and, 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 and attendees, this question of sanctions is not no. Uh, Said Hassan, 2015, I believe, uh, uh, wrote, uh, member of the diaspora, on sanctioning the EPRDF government, right? That was part and parcel of the movement to dislodge the TPLF over the past 20 years or so. So the issue of sanctions has been part of the diaspora politics, so to speak. I think what we're looking at is how is it that we can achieve that? So if I can move forward in terms of some sort of tangible things that, for instance, APAC can think about and do, one is to actually establish a committee, uh, a boycott, divestment, and sanctions committee, right? BDS committee to articulate the tools and the mechanisms by which these can actually be achieved. One is, of course, the pan-Ethiopian sort of idea in terms of the objectives, what are the objectives, the minimum objectives that are necessary. And the other is a committee that's dedicated, for instance, to uh, uh, um, uh, articulating uh, and, and vetting mechanisms of device, div divestments, as an example. Which companies? Uh, which government officials? What about which regions? The region of Somali, for instance, by Mustafa, is remarkable in its governance system, in the way it's acting. Where does ethnic cleansing happen? Oromia region? So does the Oromia regional uh, uh, administration actually uh, uh, zoom in as a focus of action uh, for accountability and responsibility? Even the Amara regional administration, are they protecting the people of Amara from war that's been declared? What about the Tigrayan TPLF interim administration? Are they diverting and stealing food that should be going to the needy? Uh, are they starting and mobilizing for war? So this requires discussion and cannot simply be handed on as on a menu of, of a to-do list, right? But requires, I think, a much more as one commentator in the chat was discussing, I think a very fruitful dialogue and debate regarding the, the tools, 
how to achieve them, the objectives, a coming to consensus around it. Uh, but there is already a consensus, a consensus that action is needed, right? Uh, so I just wanted to, to point that out and not to confuse uh, what, I've, uh, what I've actually um, talked about. Uh, unilateral sanctions that are illegal by the United States, even if you achieve that, are actually going to be very, very, very limiting, unless there's new information that I should know about, right? Uh, and it also isolates us as a movement, by the way, because you're actually asking us to be part of a movement where a, a large consensus of the, of the world has already found that unilateral coercive measures that are not authorized by the UN are illegal, immoral, and they are not part of the new international order, right? So it, it, it's, it's a very difficult situation in terms of how is it that you can change the behavior of the Ethiopian government? Uh, but that difficult situation should not simply go for the easiest, what seems to be, let's say, easiest uh, sort of uh, um, um, solution uh, on, on the tree. Rather, we should debate and talk a little bit more. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Biniam. I, I really appreciate uh, your explanations and you know delving a little bit more into what uh, you were saying. So thank you very much. Um, Mesvin, there are two people before you. Would you like to speak now? No, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have a comment. Go ahead, go ahead, please. Okay, so there's Fikru and there's also Gaitim Nuts. Fikru first and then Gaitim Nuts can speak. Fikru. Uh, can you, uh, Ash, can you, can you unmute Fikru? Yeah, Fikru de Bebe. Okay, go ahead. Can you hear and me then, now? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, oh, okay. I, I thank you uh, uh, for giving me th this opportunity to comment uh, and possibly uh, 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 weighing on some things. Uh, uh, first of all, the, this was a really good uh, discussion, and uh, the presenters, especially the uh, professor. Uh, Biniam and uh, Jeff Pierce uh, uh, have really given us some thought and to think about uh, thinking uh, about sanctions. And then also the uh, uh, Professor Biniam just uh, uh, explained some of uh, uh, the, to clear up some of the misunderstanding with his statement. I think uh, that uh, was very helpful as well. Uh, I. I'm a little bit uh, concerned about sanctions uh, uh, based on what we've been doing ourselves uh, the last two years. Uh, all of us together in unison, we have been arguing against the uh, sanctions uh, uh, and then giving the same uh, arguments that sanctions are uh, detrimental and they, they hurt people and especially the most vulnerable ones. And now, uh, Political situation like, uh, in Ethiopia changed, and uh, we turn around. Uh, uh, we want sanctions uh, rather than uh, not being lifted, uh, uh, and so we're kind of uh, in a sort of a conundrum. That is that would that be okay when we do it, and it was not okay when they were doing it uh, well, for a different purpose. So. If we we all believe and understand sanctions are going to uh, hurt people, especially the most vulnerable ones, and then at the same time, uh, especially as uh, mentioned, if it is a unilateral action, it was not uh, sanctioned by the United Nations Security Council, its impact may be very limited. But uh, at the same time, uh, uh, we are not really going to really get any. Uh, outcome that would probably satisfy all of us. So uh, definitely what what is our next best action that uh, will allow us somewhat uh, a predictable outcome that is desirable and that will uh, either uh, change the minds of the current government or uh, bring uh, the kind of changes that we would like to bring about. And then I think I like the suggestion that the Professor Biniam has made that uh, maybe you know, we should consider this point by point uh, and maybe in a smaller group and discuss and come out 
with a better way of addressing this issue. So, um, okay. Yeah. Uh, right. uh, thank you. I don't want to take too much, but no, mm -hmm. this is a point. Uh, uh, I, I guess everybody gets it. Thank you. So, uh, Gaten Nutt is the next question. Dr. Jonas has been raising his hand for some time. No, but, but there's a bit that was before him. He, he put it in the Q&A and then Dr. Jonas after that. Okay, get, get it, I don't see speaker in the Zoom. Okay, you hear me now? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, I, uh, by the way, last year there was a sanction on, uh, and HR 66, I came here and contributed the humanitarian aspect because I have the data. I, I used to uh, monitor and evaluate programs in Afar region. So I have, I have an input of overall input. So now I came with completely opposite because like everybody, we had our impression first, but now we came to determine that what happens is not against what we perceive to be. Uh, second, um, what we saying, what we are saying is, uh, I strongly, strongly fear that what we, what, what, what we are, you are thinking right now, is sanction do that, and all the world is considering others. Where, what Dr. Binam, uh, Professor Binam said last year, I don't, I do not, almost all of agree with him because um, there is this thing has came to a point of no return. And the only solution we have is to engage because either by conflict, by aggravation of conflict, miseries of the people, hunger and death will continue. It doesn't matter if you sanction or not. So but we have to catch it and lead it, engage with the Americans and um, make them in integrate our interests, long-term and short-term interests uh, with them, rather than being dictated later on, or do this or do that. You know, that, that's what hurts most. If we are engaging with them, everything is inevitable. Nothing will affect, uh, Ethiopia negatively. The only thing we have been fearing is this water thing. You don't want water, you don't want dam or something. We have 35 billion barrels of oil, 6 trillion natural gas. If they want to help us, let them help us, not water. So there's no fear of sanction or something. We have to um, just, just, create a forum, I, I don't know, I'm emotional or something. There, there is Dr. Jonas, there are a lot of people that can pinpoint which one to pick, which one to, and which one to checkmate the geopolitical prostitution of this government. Thank you, uh, I'm done. Thank you, thank you. Dr. Jonas, you're next. Unmute yourself, you're muted. No. Yeah, can go you ahead. hear me now? Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, we talk about, uh, before I go to the sanction story, um, I think this is the uh, most coward government we ever had in the history of Ethiopia. But I'm very much. They're like, we just need to ship them diaper and nothing else. Because um, Lit Saraka or the Duke Saraka and the boots. I mean, that's the way they are. So when we say sanction, it is not one size fits all. It doesn't necessarily have to be unilateral, coercive sanctions, as we know, it, like the United States uh, against Venezuela, Cuba, or, or um, Iran, something like that. There's a number of ways we can do it. I think the suggestion from Dr. Biniam to create a committee to decide which tools by what and when, that would be essential, I believe. Um, there's a number of ways you could do. 
freeze the account of the plutocratic people, like the one killing. You can freeze them, you can deny them visa. Uh, they're already um, um, under extreme pressure, they, but unfortunately. So that's why they react in so much because one person painted her face. They were just panicking, just one individual coming up. How fearful they are, how uh, coward they are. You can see that. You can freeze that count. So the, the key thing is, uh, again, uh, was Professor Binam said it in most part, but again, there is sanction instead of giving them money from World Bank, IMF, and so forth, you can stop it. That's not sanction. It's just not giving them the money that they want you alone. One other things I want to highlight to everybody is this government is in the process of collapsing. It cannot survive more than a year. I, I, I want to make sure I feel it and many people inside Ethiopia feel it. It is in the process of collapsing. Are we prepared? We as Ethiopian Americans, American Ethiopians, or the rest of the diaspora, are we prepared to see a collapsed government? And we know you everybody know what happened to Somalia. And once the government collapsed, we cannot, you know, reconstitute it together. What are the measures we want to do the change without having the government collapse? Literally, this government has no more than six months to collapse. If we continue the pressure we have today and exert more pressure, they will collapse. So what are the key things we have to alert the US government or the European or the Arabs or whoever are uh, pro-Ethiopian to make sure we still have a government by the time uh, this regime is gone. And that's the things I'm gonna, I, I want to share with you. Thank you. Thank you. And that is really the big question. Uh, um, Lahun, you're next. Unmute yourself. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, Washi. Uh, uh, I think <clears throat> uh, Professor Biniam or some others uh, are, you know, brought us very, very good point. Very, very good discussion, really. So the, what are we doing right now is just like we did the survey. We, we're trying to uh, get everybody's opinion. We're trying, to, APAC never put this sanction on the table, really. Uh, we did not really say that we want to sanction Ethiopia. We're not but opinion from everybody. everybody. So uh, what, the reason I'm saying this is because <clears throat> one of the, the participants said, well, if you guys cannot do the sanction, uh, just take me out of this group. That's not what this discussion is about, actually, because we're really learning from experts. So I just mm -hmm. want to mention that, that we're not really here to sanction the Ethiopian government, obviously, uh, we, we're discussing this. We did the survey, we're discussing this. What's everybody saying? That's the idea we're trying to share with everyone. I just want to put that, that up there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any more questions? If not, um, Ms. Finn, oh, uh, you're next, but it's not your closing <laughs> because we still have the Rajas video to see. Yeah, let's do the, let's do the video. Okay. The, oh, I'm on the one raised hand. One more. Okay. Well, I see there's two questions in the Q and A. Okay. All right. I'm sorry. Uh, so, Aman McConnell, how to convince the U.S. that it's in in its national interest to do anything? Currently, Secretary Blinken, for some reason, seems to be commending and placating the government of Ethiopia. Is, okay. How do we convince the US that it's in, in national interest to do anything? Would you like to ask it yourself the question, Aman? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Aman McConnell, if you're here, or, or someone can answer that. Oh, Adi. Is that you? Oh, 
Oh, this is not my question. Okay. What what is your question? Because your name came up. If you've raised your hands, I'm I'm on my Go ahead and ask your question. Unmute me. Unmute Aman. Ash. Yeah, she's unmuted, I guess. Okay. Uh, Adi, is that you? Are you Aman? <laughs> <laughs> Salam. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. You're unmuted. But we can't hear you. Oh, you can't see the mic? Ash, she, she can't see the mic. She should be able to speak. Uh, she's unmuted. Go ahead. Just speak. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Check one, two. Hello, everyone. Can yes, you hear yes, me? Yes, we can hear you. Hi. Go ahead. Hi, how are you? Greetings. My name is Aman. Um, thanks, APAC, for uh, having this Zoom conference. Uh, the question and comment I have is... Um, so most of the people that I see that made comments at the beginning were members of the uh, board of uh, APAC. And it was somehow the direction of conversation was personal opinions or personal views of themselves as to sanctions or no sanctions or what is happening with the Ethiopian government. And they have said so. And it's not an APAC view. So is there an APAC view as to what is happening lately in Ethiopia? Uh, and also, earlier there was a presentation by uh, a young lady with some stats. Is that are those stats endorsed by APAC? And are we having conversations around them? Um, so to continue on and to say if sanctions is what we want to do or not, or even that conversation has to be, this should be opened up to the diaspora that are either APAC members or diaspora and, you know, American Ethiopian Public Action Committee. So, so people in North America for this conversation to continue. But for some reason, I just feel that this conversation is being led towards what some members of APAC wanted to be led towards. Um, that is my opinion and question. Thank you. Thank you. So I guess we were just very obvious of what we said. We did do a survey and the survey was done with our participants and we said we are having a discussion. So there's no hidden agenda or anything other than what we are doing right now. But uh, thank you. Um, I, I thank you for your opinion. And what is very good about APAC is that we all have our opinions and our thoughts and we discuss and we come up with solutions. So that's how we work. This is not a dictatorship or anything like that. So I think the next... Uh, Shall we go to the video or what do you would you like to do? Yeah, we can go to the video, but because uh, be, before we go to the video to just address Amanus and some other questions. Um, so the purpose of uh, this conversation is, uh, is, is uh, driven from the uh, view that, that the APAC uh, membership supporters uh, expressed uh, regarding uh, you know the current situation opinion of course if APAC has issued I don't know if, if you follow the uh, APAC uh, press releases as well as the Twitter comments Twitter feeds uh, APAC has said several times has taken positions on almost everything that was not, was was not right in in APAC's opinion uh, based on the uh, uh, APAC pro pro pair principle. Uh, the APAC pro pair principle, we, are, we don't redefine that every time. I know somebody said earlier, we have to sit down and define APAC pro pair principle don't get defined every time. It's defined to be, you know, pro Ethiopia is defined as advancing democracy, human rights, free press, uh, free economy, and economic development in Ethiopia. That's 
is the same definition that we used last year, and that's the same definition we are using this year. And and so so this this encompasses what what APAC and APAC members uh, believe that. Uh, that that is yeah. Since we are on Alama here now, we are on here now. Bemila lay. So many things. Basic agreement. All in the zero. Guzo in the zero. Now, I, I know Elias. Uh, um, uh, a mil commentary channel from Elias Abdullah and some other people. Um, and there's yet a hard discussion which Linda Susi Shulu. People have to be able to discuss. Uh, comments that uh, I'm done, I'm going. I'm assuming my Obviously, I mean, this is a pull them so far into my discussion. No good. The most constructive uh, discussion uh, action is to get engaged and to have a conversation. Our Lam Sale, here is Hina with it, Mam Tatun, and now we have notified everybody. It's, 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 it's this, this is con, this is a public uh, comment. It's, it's, con, con, it's, it's, con, it's, it's, people are notified that this. Is a result that was uh, discovered. Uh, this is the, that that we we came across, and then there has to be a solution for this. And now, mundo no solutiono constructive hono, rational hono, solution mundo no. Now that if that solution involve engages or involves sort of uh, a, a legislative action, as Ethiopian Americans, Yalden power na marriage manchilo nagar is to get engaged within this country. Them describe it that record within within the rights and privilege that we have to enact some action. Either legislative con lihonishlal, it will be a private uh, uh, company related lihonishlal boycotts names absolute divestment, or it could be supporting initiatives such as uh, diaspora. Uh, 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 hold, holding on or, or, or diaspora remittances uh, again. In you know the, the the discussion, the purpose of today's discussion is what is the right thing to do. Now, do we have opinion? Yeah, absolutely, we have opinion. The organization has taken opinion also, and then if you look at the, uh, uh, like I said earlier, who is a publisher? Again, an opinion actually. We are now going into a different territory. So now we are going into actionable items that can be that go past press releases, past Twitter, Twitter feeds, past you know, angry text messages to you know governments or or World Bank or or those people. It's 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 going it's going to go past that. And that has to be there has to be some rational, good discussion. Solid conversation, and and then something that we all can can be behind, uh, if that was whatever what if the outcome was to be whatever, so that that's that is the purpose. Uh, na opinion, na the conversation maragul uh, asuna. Na ehi nyan forums in in gabes, you know, thoughtfully honu hasta wajin dayma tur elgat enyoshne ban. Uh, if you please can can send more thoughtful ideas to Runo, then uh, the fact that we are forming a committee, uh, further Negorit like Mablalat, Mbalo, Hassab, Matwal. Now, so in this end, constructive Negorit sometime, Kazabuhala, you know, the debate can continue for one more, you know, for one more round if necessary, uh, with people who actually have really. Uh, very uh, on a Sunday afternoon to pull us up to pull up balance the Alachu social technology to come with that and the same dedication call that you were going to share further flash cutter regabuhala we all have to understand uh, legislative action corner Manila everyone to understand what that means and 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 then then we have to just you know we have as you know 72 people are on board that's a majority uh, on board on some sort of legislative actions at this point to proceed, but we want to make sure what is that legislative action? What 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 does that mean? What is what is the right legislative action? Is discussion discuss, 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 and uh, otherwise yes, uh, we have consensus from the uh, the Ethiopian American community here that something has to be done. And now, so now, now and I, I just want to make sure that it's clear. 
that uh, it's uh, and then the APAC member, uh, the APAC as an organization, APAC individual opinions, uh, this is my, my individual community, uh, the, some of the leadership members, again, uh, you know, as, as, as an organization, we, we, we want to get somewhere with what is the right thing to do. Not here discussion is what is the feed me I know, let us know. I hope it's clear. Well, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Yes, and we all learn from each other and we will have these deep thoughts and discussions. I think today was very good for that. So I think we should, we should now look at the video real quick. Salam. Le... Epat board davalat and doom bezipsavala letagina chubumulu, the rejad msi balalu, bala foamet, ye epak in topia gemangist, a mishashala bet in manged, metacum committee lamaco common nan in betamelecate, tela you touch lamacade, a midaragon thread, cat home as fentaganuga, coordinates other gequi charloin, Sinjamir in a baron alama. ከዚህ በፊት በነበሩ ስብሰባዎች ላይ ተብራርተዋል ከዛ ወዲ ደግሞ አሁን ተላዩ ለውጦች ስላደረግን ያንን ዳብራራ ተጠይቄ ዛሬ መገኘት ነበርብኝ በሰዓቱ በአካል ነገር ግን እንዳጋጣሚ ወደ ጃካርታ ኢንዶኔዢያ ተጉጃለሁኝ እዛ ነው ያለሁት ና የሰዓቱ ልዩነት ከወደ 11 ሰዓት ነው ወደ 11 ሰዓት ይቀርማል አሁን ያለውበት እና በዛ ምክንያት ለመገኘት ስላልቻልኩኝ ይሄንን መልክት ቀድቼ ልክ ያለሁኝ ያለንበትን ደረጃ ለትበትንሹ ለማብራራት እና አንድ አንድ ሐሳብ ለማካፈል ባልገኝም በዚህ መልክ ቀድቼ ብልከው የተሻለ ይሆናል ብዬ ስላሰብኩ ነው እና ስንጀምር ባለፈው ባለፉት ብዙራቶች ያሰብናቸው ያቀድናቸው ለቦርዱ ገልጻል ነበር በመጀመሪያው ነው አላማው የኢትዮጵያ ችግር አንዱ ሊፈታ የሚችለው ህገ መንግስቱ ሲሻሻል ነው የሚለውን በማመን እንዴት ሊሻሻል ይችላል የሚለውን ደሞ የተወሰኑ ሰዎች ዝም ብለው የሚናገሩት ሳይሆን በደም ጥና ተደርጎ ሐሳቦችን አቅርቦ ያንን እነዚህን ሐሳቦች በጽሁፍ መልክ ለፓርላማውም ለ በህራዊት የሚያካሄደው ኮሚሽን ለማቅረብ ነበር የመጀመሪያ የነበረው ሐሳብ ኢትዮጵያ ውስጥ በተለያዩ ለውጦች አልፋለች አገራችን አሁን ባለው ሁኔታ እኛ እንዳሰብ ነው በየከተማው ይሄድን ውይይት ያስደረግን ሰው ስለዚህ ጉዳይ እንዲውያይ ለማድረግ ያቀድ ነው አላማ አሁን ባለው አትሞስፌር ለማሳካት ትንሽ እንደሚያስቸግር የተሰማን ያንን በማገናዘብ ስራው ይግድ ይቀጥላል መቀጠልም ያለበት ስራ ነው ምክንያቱም ያው ህገ ማሻሻል የግድ አስፈላጊ ነው እንዴት ነው የሚሻሻል የሚለውን ደግሞ በውይይት የሚደረግ እንጂ ዝም ብሎ የተወሰኑ ሰዎች ተገናኝተው ጽፎ የሚሰጡት ነገር አይደለም ያንን ውይይት ግን ለማካሄድ አሁን ያለው አትሞስፌር በጣም አስቸጋሪ ነው የሚሆነው እና ምንድነው ማድረግ ያለብን እንዴት ነው ምን ሄደው ወደ አቅጣጫ ነው ሄደ የሚለውን ስንወያይ ቆይተናል የnomination process almost አጠናቀናል ብዙ የተጠቆሙ ሰዎች አሉ አሁን ኮሚቴ ኦርጋናይዝ ለማድረግ ፕሮሰስ ላይ ነው ያለ ነው ያንን በመናረግበት ጊዜ ግን ካለ ሁኔታ ተነስተን አሁን ከዚህ ሁኔታ ጋር የሚሄድ ሂደት መመረጥ አለብን ያን እንዴት ነው ምናደርገው የሚለውን ተዋይተን ያንን ለማስረዳት ነው አሁን ጥረት ማደርገው የደረስንበት ድምዳሜ አሁን ፎከስ ማድረግ ያለብን ጽሁፎችን እና ጥናቶችን በማውጣት ላይ ነው ጽሁፎች ጥናቶችን በተለያዩ ስኮላሮች ይያስወጣን ውይይቱን እንዲቀጥል ማስተረክ የአገራችን ሁኔታ ትንሽ ተረጋግቶ ሰው የተለያዩ ኢሹዎችን አድሬስ ያደረገ ነው አሁን 
ملابات سب سب بلو زی لای فوکس مادرگی میشل بات سیچویشن به میفتر بگذی یعنی پابلیکویت مادرگی چرا لهم بالونی تاگن سکوفو چند ماسوتات ناسو چند ماست انات یتله ایوب ویتو چه میکرد کوانا آنلاین دیگ در رگو مادرگ لذا یه میان کمیته یعنی تاسابی ادرگو یعنی کمیته ما واقعه میلولای درسنال لذا مسارت کمیته ونا واقعه الان سکولارو چند میگن یوبت که لذا تنات میکرد بات اندیهم دمو آورون میسرو انسوسیشن و چن رکروت ادرگن فن سونگا تناتو چی میکه رو بهت ملک لام درگ نو عصب نو یعنی که تو مسونگا بکر بیه سرانو بکر بو این کمیته آقای کمین چند سالن که زاویه سراغ میجمر بگیزه تا چه ماری آپدیت این سالن نه یا هنی آلونی تا اینو علامت چنم یالوتن تلایو کنسرشون است یالوتن پروفیژنچ تلایو انگازوچ و امن ماست راکچونم به تکلیل به تملاکتای تلایو صوفش که تناتگا مثلا تدرگون لیوتونو نه زادی بیت لاینگ دیو لاتشم دو ساعت فو گاب زالن به زار ساعت نه ایوانو لگی زالن اما سگنال and then we're closing. Now, Bajor, go ahead, Zeke. Uh, can you unmute Zeke, Ash? Okay, yeah, I, I was unmuted before, so I can unmute myself. Okay, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, we okay. can hear you. Uh, the professor, I don't know if he understood it. Let's uh, comment on In the Aguinet, America government, hotel control, yellow sanction. به ایلیگال نمالت نو باید این دنکاری میلود تیپکل از سال مساله یه سر چهارم مست مالکت چالو لیلا و میچرند شو کامنتال این نت یه کل این لی نتو مسئله بل ل بوردوم ل اپات بورد داره یه سوال سب نو میبی لیلا سوال نور چیلال تو ریسید 2023 24 اجندا اوف اپات نو ریسید هم نادرگو و ریم مساله تونو نمیشم برم. دیا پو ایتالیا جنده میلو یه رگوی آلو پرو ایتالیا جنده و سپورتی دگمان مات. آخونی آلو پرو ایتالیا جنده از اپوزی دگمان مات. یعنی سو و اکسپت لارگم کرده. این گورنمنت اپوزی لارگال اپاکی میلو نه. ایه دیتا سبب نو. The basic principle I care. The democracy. The equal right, lemon and barrel, and all the whole implementation of the project agenda reset the direct soon discussion. But no, that is a discussion. Mark it later. In the Zara, we need understanding and below comment. I'm starting. Charshal. Thank you. Masun Madisolin Abara, here in the Yagi. And him presents our sometimes on a major introduction. Ula Yakut Mindeno. APAC has always been. Agenda was pro Ethiopia. Pro Ethiopia was never pro government. Mengist, we yanin si waga yanin nagar support ada bagel. We because Mengist was pro, was taking a pro Ethiopia agenda. So that does not change. So that's why if you listen to my introduction, ahun pro Ethiopia defining matter go yahun Ethiopia was the situation no. And so that's where I went over all those things that are happening under this government at this point. So let's see. Mission on in principle, I know. Good strategy. Let me cut to the time that you are not. You love what I look because of what is happening there in the reality. But APAC was and remains pro Ethiopia. The agenda is with the people. That's what it is. Now, Bohala Nagagar and Chalam Basafus, as you would like. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. یک اهل آتش سر و چال می‌گن بزوس آت کت نویم یک آتشون یلا کلن اور این از 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 کابل اف یکی از جنا ویل کنکلیت آتو مرد برگله مجب مریا کس آتنا گرم گوید آن میوت مرد 
Thank you so much. Uh, uh, I just felt to address this meeting uh, because, I'm, because I'm, I'm happy to see my EPAC colleagues after five, six uh, months of absence. And I still don't feel completely not recovered. However, I feel much, much better. Uh, but I should be, I should keep myself away from uh, from Mike. I should keep away from writing articles or or reading too much and so on. That's why. But I I don't want to miss this this meeting. That's why I, I joined you guys. Uh, with that said, I, I thank all the speakers uh, for their marvelous uh, ad address. I just have one question. Uh, one question and a couple of comments. The question is, do we have by any chance or is it possible to get uh, a data with respect to sanctions? Because most of the time that we spent seems to be around the sanctions. Is there any, any data with respect to sanctions that was in the past? I know uh, there've been uh, here and there attempts to Put to boycott European Alliance, to boycott Bank in general, blah, blah, and so on. I don't know. I don't think there is, but how, I'm just throwing this question if there is a possibility to get some data. I know the government gets $4 billion a year with the remittance from diaspora. Let's assume with uh, conservative estimates, 50%. Uh, Join the the, the, the the sanction or the boycott. How would that be effective with respect to really, uh, really having an impact on the Ethiopian government? To most people, it's, it's a dent. It's a chicken feed. Most people that's what they consider. Okay, I, I leave that for the board. I mean, if we get data, that'll be fine. Uh, other than that, let me just have a, a couple of comments on the on the reports. I wish uh, uh, the report on finance be supported by audit audit reports. I assume that audit reports would be for the general meeting of APAC. That's what I said for the general meeting of APAC. And uh, uh, Musfan's report, uh, I would like to be included uh, in uh, the local media. Uh, I know he extensively dealt with the international media, but there is also that you guys did uh, uh, making aware the diaspora here in the States, not only here in the States, but uh, as well as in Ethiopia with Ethiopian news agencies and other uh, television stations. So the local media coverage that APAC did was uh, really extensive. So, and uh, the July, was it July, July 4th? APAC participated at ASFNA. That I think that should be also included to my opinion. Other than that, we need to have a further discussion. I'm, I'm sure most of you agree that with one or two uh, sessions, we don't come up concrete solutions for Ethiopian problems. So we need to have uh, really uh, a repeated discussions, more specific on certain issues, I mean, on, on, on certain agendas and so on. Thank you so much for giving Thank the time. You. Appreciate okay. it. Thank you. So now, uh, Hewitt, he, she has raised her hand. And then I'm just going to close it. Okay, and Naman. Hewitt, you go now. And everybody, please short. Go ahead, Hewitt Kabra Mariam, unmute yourself. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, thank you for the opportunity and for a great session. Um, I just wanted to share my thought process based on you know what you have been discussing on having the need to have a defined strategy and that would be uh, deep thought um, and thinking. It cannot be done um, in an expedited uh, manner because it may have negative impacts. So. Um, just looking at the process on how that could be. Um, first off, we need to have a common understanding on the what, right? What are we um, fighting for? And I think 
uh, that should be, you know, the safety and security of all people in Ethiopia, regardless of their ethnic background. And that may sound like a very simple thing to say, but it may not necessarily be shared by everyone because in some instances, advocacy is done based on specific self-interest or of a specific group. Um, and I believe that when you are standing for the safety and security of all Ethiopians, there is a, a lot more opportunity to get backing. Um, and once you have the what, right? So the next question is the how. How do you want to ensure the safety and security of all people? And um, then you would be, that would need also another deeper thought, like what would bring change? Are you looking at the bigger picture constitutional change? Or are you looking at specific human rights um, abuses being done? And do you want to reverse that? What are the questions that you are asking for and being very specific about that? And based on that, what, what type of sanctions or actions from the diaspora would be most effective to bring or influence that change? So once you have defined the how, I think the next step would be, who are you going to reach out to? So based on the type of, for example, sanctions that you're proposing, it could be you know, economic sanctions and you're reaching out to the US legislators, and the US executive. Um, it could be other European countries that have economic ties with our, with our country, um, UK, Germany, others that have bigger impacts. Um, and then, you know, and then also the diaspora, right? How to reach out to them, how should they be um, uh, acting, right? Some of us, we don't know what we, we should exactly be doing, right? Remittance, yes, but how, like, but how does it exactly work? How do we still keep on supporting our families and, and friends in our home country while also trying to influence the change? Um, so all that needs to be defined based on the who. Um, and the last question is the why. So the why can be crafted based on the specific target audience that you're reaching out to. Um, so as you guys have said, if you're reaching out to the US government executive offices or the US legislators, their primary interest is national security of the US. And then for the legislators is their constituents. So having really you know, um, strong data on what their constituents look like, uh, where are most Ethiopians, where can we bring influence would be you know, something that would really um, be interesting for the lawmakers, for the legislators. Uh, when it comes to the US executive offices, um, they're already elected, they're already implementing, right? Uh, um, the, 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 the tasks of the executive. So their primary interest is national security. If um, Ethiopia is not stable, the regional you know, security will be impacted. So will the, the, the US national security so the why can be crafted based on your target audience. And I'm talking about just the US because that's what I know more uh, closely. Uh, other European countries can also be reached out to and they may have their own specific interests. So the why should be crafted based on who you are reaching out to. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Uh, Ato Betro. Thank you so much. Could you, could you, uh, Ash, could you unmute uh, Betru, V E T R U? Yes. Ato Betru, yeah. unmute yourself, please. You're still muted. You're muted. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Right. Samar. Salam lo la chum, but I'm groom with Yeti Yakaiden now. On a two overall a pack of a lafutula tamatat, it a catalo masmarina, Yasma Zagavacho and Delochi, Batacala is in Gaman Gup, but the Kikling Yamasmar Lai Monachinena, Lagarachilua Lai Natana, Lesvachin and the net, Emita Mua Quara Quargo de Ochelai to Krat Maragachin, Bermakinata in net, and now Hulunum Neger Betanatina. Bagum Gamala Yetamasarata, Ermijamos at Magalesa Chimotat, 
ያደረገው ጥረት ውጤታማ መሆኑን በግልጽ የሚያሳይ በመሆኑ በእውነቱ ላማራሩና በዚህ ስራ ላይ ለሳተፉት ሁሉ ከፍተኛ አድናቆትና ክብሮት ይገባቸው አለላለሁ እኔ ኮሜንት ማድረግ የፈለኩት አተርኒ ደረጃ ያለው ርስ ህግ ወይንም ገመንግስት በመንለው ላይ በተለምዶ የሰጠው መግለጫ ወይም ለንሰራ የታቀደው ነገር በጣም በጣም መሰረታዊና አስፈላጊ ነው ግን ካገላለጹ ሁኔታው ሲመቹ እንምጃን ነው ስላልን የሚል ስሜት አሳደረብኝና እሱን ትንሽ ግልጽ ለማድረግ ነው ሁኔታዎችን መጠበቅ አለብን ወይስ ሁኔታዎችን አቅራጫ መጠቆም አለብን የሚለው ሁለቱ ፋይን የሆነ ዲንትን ልዩነት አላቸው በእኔ አስተያየት ሲናሪዮዎችን ራሱ አንቲሲፔት በማድረግ ይሄ መንግስት በራሱ ክብደት እስኪወድቅ ድረስ መጠበቅ የለብንም ምንድናቸው ያሉት አማራጮች የሚለው የተለያዩ ሲናሪዮዎችን አናላይዝ በማድረግ ይሄ ቢሆን በዚህ መልኩ ፕሮሰሱ ህገ መንግስቱን የመቀየር ወይ ማዲስ የመጻፉንትን በዚህ መልኩ ቢካሄድ እንዲህ አይነት ደሞ ክስተት ቢፈጠር በድንገት አሁን ሁኔታዎች ቢላወጡ ምን ማድረግ እንችላለን የሚለው አስቀድሞ ታስቦበት የተለያዩ ሲናሪዮዎች በመከተል ዝግጅት ማድረጉ በጣም ስለሚጠቅም ኮሚቴው በሚቋቋምበት ጊዜ እዛ ላይ ትኩረት እንዲያደርግ ለማሳሰብ ነው በጣም አሁን ሰግናለሁ thank you very good thank you very much nene uh man namen blesh number kagash betu wal okay katl namen he what could you okay. please uh, send me your number circulation uh, first uh, what uh, he what uh, presented or uh, said uh, very pertinent and relevant uh, or why uh, how what milutin but uh, that, uh, i think we should really uh, do undertake some study do diligence and uh, a strategic uh, uh, brainstorming uh, the sanction aspect uh, again to reiterate what i said earlier we have to start with the understanding what leverage does the diaspora has what can we do there are few only few leverage points we have number one this government directly needs economic assistance so let's agree that one of the leverage points that we have is to use this economic support financial support for the government to be coupled with conditions of significant human rights respect for human rights accountability and transparency so that's a broad framework so what kind of sanctions as you know sanctions is very broad i think one of the problem is the elephant in the room there are diplomatic sanctions there are defense sanctions travel sanctions etc what kind of a combination of the sanctions could put the needed pressure on the government to change its behavior towards respect for human rights justice the safety and security is very important what you had said we have to uh, capitalize on universal principles and values that are aligned with western values as well this cannot be a partisan while the grievances and the atrocities committed for example on amara has to be presented the data when we advocate it has to be about justice equality liberty safety and security of all ethiopians and that is at stake by the way although the the target by now is one ethnic group so that way we could really galvanize a lot of support within ethiopia as, uh, as well as in the us among many uh, sectors the other uh, point i wanted to reiterate Uh, or uh, respond to is what uh, ato merit bakala uh, stated earlier which is about remittances if we can galvanize the diaspora if we present our case we have done it before 2018 before 2018 as you recall uh, mr ato merit 
and others, uh, there was an international campaign for rerouting remittance. Significantly terrified the regime, the DPLF regime. The foreign ministry issued three statements via its spokesman on VOA and Deutsche Welle. And when Abi, the prime minister, came to power, one of the first things he asked of the diaspora is to suspend this campaign. We, I was back then uh, in the leadership of the patriotic Gimbo Sabbath, and I was directly uh, facilitating this international campaign. I was told by the chairman to, 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 that the request has come to uh, convene the committee and uh, decide to suspend the campaign. It was an international task force, Gumbo 7, plus many advocacy organizations signed up for it. Don't feed the beast. It was a very impactful campaign, which really uh, 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 put tremendous pressure on the regime. So I just want to give you this precedence, uh, 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 Mr. Merritt. Thank you. Thank you, Naaman. Uh, so I think with this, we are um, at the end of our uh, at the end of our uh, meeting conference, and I think Musman, you can send us all home. Okay. Thank you, Asi. Thank you for uh, guiding us uh, very successfully and very professionally. We we admire you. Uh, you know. Uh, this was a very uh, productive session as expected. Uh, thank you for all of you for staying more than two and a half hours, almost three hours. Uh, uh, we understand why you are here and, and uh, we all are here for a reason. Now, number one, uh, just going back to Atobathru's comment, the constitutional am amendment work is exactly going to be done the way you, you propose. Th that was the reason I, I know the reject couldn't articulate it uh, uh, because it was on a video message very well, but that's exactly where we are going on that, is to, to understand what to do. So that's uh, not to paint, hold anything off, but to, to understand what to do and what the appropriate next actionable item is. Re regarding the discussion that we had today, there are, there are uh, a variety of next steps on this. Uh, as as so many of you suggested, uh, it's it's always uh, uh, we can always continue to have further uh, uh, brainstorming, uh, but but at the same time we also understand the urgency of this. Uh, we also and, and, and we also understand that urgency doesn't mean does it, that doesn't mean that it has it has to be done in a haphazard way. It has to be done carefully. It has to be well thought. It has to be deliberate, and. Um, you know, as a next step, uh, we probably we, we would uh, uh, do a congressional hearing activities. Congressional hearing are fast finding activities. Uh, the act activities will foc we can 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 focus on congressional hearings and understanding what what is being done, uh, what's happening in that part of the country. You know, as as we just, as we said at the beginning of our conversation, uh, both. The U.S. and Ethiopia interests are aligned in what we do, and a congressional hearing can can be a starting point for that. As as we as we get through that uh, activity, uh, there will be further uh, deliberation and uh, it, all necessary engagements with all parties to see if you know if the situations can be. You know, manageable or or cor correctable or reversible, uh, so that the people of Ethiopia don't suffer the way they, they suffer at this point. And with that, uh, if uh, there was a committee to, to be formed, uh, I know uh, we have we have the participants' email. Uh, I we have got, we have received very constructive comments from most of you. Will reach out. Uh, please make time to to join and uh, help us out on, on figuring this thing further. Um, other than that, uh, very much appreciate your time again. Thank you very much. And I will say, I, I know uh, we have comments uh, 
from few people who will take those comments and, and then make sure that we respond or we, we act on it. Uh, APAC has to stay where it is. It has been a political organization. It cannot by, by law be affiliated to any political party, nor to any government, absolutely not to any foreign government. And that is a, that, that, and that's how it, it can effectively do its job. Uh, Wasi has ex explained what that meant. You know, when 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 a system functions right, a system is pro Ethiopia. So that's what we have been doing in the past two years, working closely with the system. When the system is not functioning right, right, then it's not pro Ethiopia. So then we have to have a, a conversation. The system can change its way of doing things. So there are so many things can happen. So. With that, everyone, thank you for, uh, for your attention. And now, welcome, Mishit. Thank you again, and uh, be well.